Welcome everybody to tonight's ordinary meeting. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Darug and Dark and Junk people as traditional custodians of the land and acknowledging all Aboriginal people, past Aboriginal elders, past, present and emerging. Um, I'll hand over to the General Manager for the procedural items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to advise in accordance with Clause 5.18 of the Code of Meeting Practice, meetings of the Council are recorded. In the terms of the Privacy and Personal Information Protection Act, this may involve recording of personal information provided at the time of the meeting. The recordings are made to assist staff in compiling the minutes of the meeting and to enable the podcasting of council meetings. The provision of any information that is recorded is voluntary. If a person does not wish to be recorded, they should not address or request to address the meeting. The recordings will be made available to other persons where such access is in accordance with the relevant regulations. The recordings are stored on council's record management system. For the benefit of those persons who will be addressing the council tonight, it is expected that you will refrain from any insult, allegation or personal reflection against any person present or not at this meeting. This request relates to both your address to council and any answers given in response to questions from councillors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any apologies? Um, I think we have a leave of absence to record, General Manager. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, at the council meeting of the 8th of February 2022, council resolved to approve an application from Councillor Paul Beagle for a uh, leave of absence for the ordinary meeting of council of the 22nd of February 2022. Thank you. Um, declarations of interest. Any declarations? Councillor yes, Richards. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item 38, item 43. 3843. Councillor Sheather. Mr. Mayor, have you got a mayoral minute? No. Are you referring to the RSL motion that I circulated? Yes. Yeah, that's um, that's a, a staff report. It is um, item 39. Yeah, I, I declare a, a less than a significant uh, pecuniary interest. Um, the uh, you to read your specific interest when we get to the item. Just I'll just note that I, I have it there. So when okay. when we get yep. to the item, I'll let, we'll, we'll come back to you and let you read that on. Um, Thank you. Any other interests to declare? I've got an interest in item 43. Okay. Um, confirmation, actually I might just go first. We've got a condolence motion. We might do that now, um, first up. So Councillor Zamprogno had indicated his intention to move a condolence motion. Sorry there, Councillor Zamprogno, with the condolence motion. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I'm having difficulty with my connection. It's very choppy. Can you hear me? We can, it is a bit in and out. Um, sorry, I just thought it might be more appropriate to go straight to the condolence motion at this stage. Um, can we bring that up on the screen if staff have access to it and someone else might, in the absence of council and probably not being able to? Someone want to move that so we can get it on the record? I'm happy to move that, Mr. Mayor. Moved Councillor Wheeler, seconded Councillor Kotlash. Oh. Um, uh, in, in the absence of Councillor Zemprogna, I'll just say a few words and um, note on behalf of uh, that I'm, I'm very happy that Councillor Zemprogna brought this up. It was very sad um, to hear of the passing of Dick, um, big personality in, in Tennyson, um, a local business that everybody knows, huge contribution to our community um, through service to the RFS and in other capacities as well. Um, so, yeah, I think it's very appropriate that we honour that tonight. Did anybody else want to say anything here? Yes, I, I think I've restored my connection, Mr. Mayor. Back. Yes, thank you. No, that counts as important. All right, then. Um, uh, I wanted to move this condolence motion and say that we have lost one of the greats recently with the passing of Dick Patricus from Tennyson at the age of 83. Dick ran his business on Tennyson Road, selling all manner of farm equipment for over 50 years. He spent 43 of those as the captain of the Tennyson RFS from 1976 to 2001 and a further 14 years as deputy until his semi-retirement in 2015. Dick, his mother and sisters fled their ancestral home in Lithuania towards the end of World War II. Travelling by rowboat, they were intercepted by fishermen and ended up interned in a migrant camp that was eventually liberated by the British. The family decision to emigrate uh, to Australia instead of Britain was apparently sealed by the impression that the family gained of Australia from watching Chip's Rafferty movies. 
They arrived at the migrant hostel in what is now Sparvel National Park, just up the road from where I live, in 1948, and the rest is history. Dick and his family have been fixtures in the Hawkesbury community ever since. Dick's business traded with Colo Shire Council and then its successor, Hawkesbury Shire Council. He was awarded the National Medal in 1993 and had since added two clasps for his extraordinarily long service. Dick could be proud that his whole family went on to become contributors to the Hawkesbury community in their own right, in the RFS, SES and elsewhere. I acknowledge Dick's wife, Julia, and their children, Chris, David, Marianne, Greg and Steve. I enjoyed speaking with Chris today, who is himself decorated with the Australian Fire Service Medal to put together these notes. Dick left behind 11 grandchildren, eight great-grandchildren and more are on the way. We have lost too many of our local greats recently with the passing of Orb Voller and then Albert Newton, Peter Speet, Lionel Smith and now Dick Patrikas. I invite my fellow councillors to join me in a moment's silence to mark Dick's passing. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Sheehan, did you want to say something as well? So you just muted yourself, Councillor Sheehan. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, Ms. Mayor, I, I'd known Dick and the family for a long while. Um, when, when we first started the Sports Council, um, we called it a marriage between the community and council in relation to staff, staffing and, and, and how they may, uh, we may not have issues with staffing. And so a lot of voluntary work was done. And in those days, uh, Dick um, had a lot of mowing equipment and the like. Um, and it wasn't a day, it wasn't a week. It was 18 months that he um, uh, that he worked with us. Um, when I say worked with us, he, he, he supplied the equipment for volunteers to to mow playing fields and the likes. Um, uh, that was the sort of bloke he is, and and the rest of his family is no different. Um, they're extremely community minded, and um, yeah, he'll be sorely missed. Thank you, Council Lance Bucket. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to echo uh, the words that the two previous councillors just said, um, and to also just. Uh, thank the Patrikas family. They are one of the local families where we have generations of people that give service to this community. So um, the children and particularly to Marion, um, I'd like to say thanks for their continuing service because then their children take it on and we see what a valuable um, contribution they make. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll oh, Councillor Dovamachi. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. And this kind of things that, uh, like I said, I always uh, admit that, you know, I'm behind times, as you know, that you know, I'm the uh, new ones. Uh, I didn't know the gentleman. Naturally, I haven't met him, but uh, in Western world, it's always like, you know, in situations like that, uh, it's all, always, you know, good words. And uh, he was very dearly missed. And we uh, uh, send our condolences and this and that or whatever. I don't know whether you'd agree with me or not. Uh, in times of like this, I think, you know, more than, you know, just words, whether it would be appropriate or not, if we could collect some money and uh, send it to uh, his uh, widow or his children, they may not need money, but I think, you know, some kind of a contribution then, if nobody agrees with me, would somebody uh, be kind enough to give me the address and I will uh, send him a small uh, 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 payment uh, to contribute uh, on behalf of the council. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Dr. Machu. That sounds like something more of a private arrangement. Than okay. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll put the motion first, all in favour. Declare it carried. And we'll carry out now that moment of silence. Thank you, everybody. Um, if someone wanted to move the minutes from the previous meeting. Moved Councillor Reed and seconded Councillor Zemprogno. 
Any discussion? All those in favor? Declare it carried. Um, we have two items subject to public address. Uh, our first item subject to public address is item 39. We have two speakers against uh, the motion, um, Mr. Jeffrey Brown and Mr. John Ross. So we'll just let those people into the meeting. Mr. Brand in the meeting, I can't see. He was before. Oh, here he is. Yeah, no, no. My screen. Um, Mr. Brand, we're ready for you now. So can you hear us, Jeff? Can you can you hear us, Jeff there? If not, we might go to John Ross and come back to Mr. Brand. Mr. Ross, are you ready? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, sorry. If someone from staff could contact Mr. Brand just while Mr. Ross is speaking, so we'll have him next. Thanks. When you're ready, uh, Mr. Ross. Thank you kindly. I'm seeking not to support the recommendation provided by staff. The report itself is factually inaccurate in a major degree. The relevant legislation came into force on the 1st of July 2018. Since that time, Council has expended something in the order of $800,000 within that precinct, um, of which I would estimate 80% was funded by grant. Um, that would indicate quite clearly that the 2013 plan of management still has carriage with the Department of uh, DPIE and OEH. So the claim made by the author that uh, this report is contingent uh, 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 upon uh, the new legislation is uh, not able to be substantiated. Uh, the, the second element of this is that the community consultation that was conducted in 2020 itself should have been subject to a report to council either in the prior term or this term and then voted upon by the elected body to determine the elected body's attitude towards whatever proposals and suggestions had come through on the community consultation. Now that has not occurred and I cite that as, as a gross breach of the uh, responsibilities of the elected body and also support the recommendations not being um, uh, reasonable. Now, um, furthermore, the so-called 2022 draft plan of management was, I believe, prepared on the basis of a desktop review. Oh, sorry, you're muted, uh, Mr. Ross. Not sure how that happened. We lost you after desktop review. Sorry, you're still muted. Mr. Mr. Ross, you're, you're muted. Is there that better? That's better. So we lost you after your statement about being a desktop review. Uh, uh, okay, yes. I believe the draft POM, as we're looking at tonight, was apparently a, a prepared on a, a basis of a, draft, a desktop review. Now, I, I uh, cite that that desktop review has apparently been prepared without knowledge of a response from DPI and OEH to an application under Section 60 of the Heritage Act which was supplied to council on the 5th of December 2018 in the form of a letter. 
That letter clearly enunciated specific conditions on the then proposed park upgrades. This is prior to some of this 800,000. Those conditions are not evident in the 2022 upgraded draft plan of management. Furthermore, council undertook various works in the park during the last term of council without approval of DPI or OEH or compliance with normal planning and legis legislative approvals. Those changes and additions have not been incorporated in the 2022 document that we are looking at this evening, nor are the attendant Australian standards applicable to those works incorporated within the, within the draft plan of management. So in other words, the report is inaccurate. The community consultation is, is uh, failed. Th thirdly, the staff have apparently uh, s sought a new draft plan of management, which is uh, uh, an update of the 2013 plan of management, which is still operative. But the person charged with doing that has been given the wrong specifications or has not been informed by the staff of the activity between council and DPIOEH in the interim. Mr. Ross, your time's expired. We did lose a little bit while you were muted, so if you could just wrap up. Uh, yes, I'll uh, close off now, if I may, with a few things. Mm -hmm. uh, the next point I would like to address is where to now? Uh, firstly, reject all staff recommendations. Two, Inform the lead proponent of, McQuaid, uh, of the McQuaid Park development that it is not available for enhanced commemorative structures, either temporary or permanent. Three, develop a plan of management, uh, sorry, the draft plan of management as we're looking at be rejected. Four, a new update of the 2013 plan of management be sought based on actual site conditions now, plus all DPIE OEH approvals and correspondence that have occurred in the interim. Lastly, the new update of the draft plan of management when prepared be initially submitted to the Heritage Advisory Committee and then go to council for its ultimate approval before approaching DPI, OEH on any future development or improvements to the park area. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Ross. Um, I just had one question, which was, if you could just give us some detail around what works you believe have been carried out that are not reflected in the, in the plan. Uh, I can do that. They are rather lengthy. I would suggest that, um, Staff might provide you, Mr. Mayor, and your fellow councillors, a letter addressed from the Office of Heritage uh, um, uh, in the name of, let me just dig out the person's name. Uh, the author is Katrina Stankowski. It is dated the 5th of the December 2018. And it was addressed to a Mr. Craig Johnson, uh, then Parks Officer at Hawkesbury City Council. And uh, the reference is application under Section 60 of the Heritage Act 1977. Therein lies an, a number of uh, elements. Some of what uh, has come up in the community consultation was roundly rejected by DPI at that time. And um, there, Works have not been carried out, uh, as uh, at least in part, in, in uh, one section of the letter, which is point three, design modifications. Amended drawings must be prepared by suitably qualified, qualified landscape architect with a selection from the two trees on the island within the land, uh, sorry, the lake precinct, based on the historic values of the site and submitted 
with the Section 60 application. Now, there is no reference to that at all in the draft POM that I've looked at for this meeting. And uh, in other words, Council is not compliant even with what was written at that stage, let, let alone what it's proposing now. So, so um, th there is a big void, which is only going to lead to disaster. I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Mr. Ross? No, thank you, Mr. Ross. Thank uh, you. Mr. Brandy, are you there now and able to hear us? You're muted at the moment. That should pop up with a message asking to unmute. Unmute. There we are. Thank you. We're ready for anybody. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, councillors, council staff and guests and other attendees. I thank you for the opportunity to speak at your meeting tonight. That I wish to register the Windsor and District RSL sub-branches disapproval of the draft plan of management from McQuaid Park with its current requirements and restrictions for the placement of a new war memorial, which is now to be known as the Cenotaph in McQuaid Park on the western side of the Ornamental Lake. The exact position is where the Anzac Day and Remembrance Day commemorations have been held since 2015. We believe that the placement by the Ornamental Lake will be a community and cultural item of interest to visitors. It will add to the cultural aspect of the park in keeping with Governor Macquarie's vision for park use. It will not deter or impinge on any other known or future activities within the park. The Windsor and District sub wish to make known that the construction costs of the Senator will be met wholly by the sub at no cost to the Hawkesbury Council or the Hawkesbury community. The Cenotaph will be a community asset and an asset that will continue to be a focal point for commemorations with safety of the attendees paramount. The Windsor and District RSL sub branch has been trying to have the memorial, sorry, the Cenotaph constructed since 2015. Needless to say, the Windsor and District RSL sub branch members have become very frustrated with these delays. We've met all the requirements that have been placed upon us at quite costly expense to the sub branch. At the direction from council, we had to engage a heritage landscaper and a consultant archeologist to check if there were any indigenous artifacts in or on the site. It is now time for the Hawkesbury to have a major remembrance site for all of the community. The words, we will remember them, have a very powerful meaning that cannot be denied. We will remember those that paid the eternal sacrifice so that we can live the life that we live today. The Cenotaph does not differentiate between events in our military history. It represents all events, wars and conflicts, and more importantly, all veterans. We have no intention or purpose or propose, sorry, that there be any diminishing of the importance of the existing memorial in Memorial Park. And we will continue to conduct smaller, smaller uh, commemorations, commemoration services there, example, the Ball War, as long as they can be conducted with safety being paramount to the public. Because the report for determination with specific references to Windsor and District RSL sub-branch in the agenda does not reflect the actual draft plan of management. I therefore ask that serious consideration be given to not approving the draft plan of management in its present format. I well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brandy. Have you any questions, Mr. Brandy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Thank you, Mr. Mayor. He's very old. Um, do you have YouTube on or anything there? Me? Yeah, a lot of feedback. No, no, sorry, Mr. Brand. Oh. We're getting feedback whenever we 
we speak. Um, he's, muted. he's muted now, so that might make If you wanted to ask your question while he's on mute, then he can answer yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Brandon. I know this has been a lengthy process for you. I, I, I know uh, that the RSL have been trying for some time. I'm just wondering, can you tell us uh, who drew up the plans for the um, memorial, for the actual structure? You're on mute now, Mr. Brand, just to remind it. Sorry. Sorry, uh, Councillor Bucket on back at lines. Bucket on back again. Uh, <laughs> That's OK. I, I'm, I'm just trying to, to get the uh, name of the actual... Uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, just wondering if it's a regular architect or a, um, um, a heritage um, architect. Sorry, you're on mute, Mr. Brand. No apology. Can you hear me now? We can. Hello. Yes, we Hello. can. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, we had them drawn up by an uh, engineering uh, firm. So they have they engineering have specifications and everything with them. Yes, they do. Okay. okay. Um, I'm just I'm wondering, wondering uh, have they formed part, part of an application before? Sorry, you're on mute, Mr. Brand. I'm not, not sure what's happening there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm back. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, when we had the uh, uh, consultant uh, brought in, uh, we raised the S60 application and had a place with uh, State Heritage. As we had already uh, instigated a, a DA through council, we were of the belief that the DA had gone through to um, State Heritage. However, we were then informed by State Heritage that they can't do anything with it until they get the DA from council. And that was the first we knew, which is approximately, uh, well, I think it was about three years after we started, or two years, sorry, after we started, about the December of 2017. And... Uh, uh, council then um, debated, um, council staff that is, debated, and um, eventually they told us in the July, I think it was, of 2018, or it might have been 19, that they suddenly discovered that the general manager of the Hawkesbury Council did not have the authority to sign the DA because the property, the, the um, uh, McQuay Park did not belong to the council and he didn't have the authority to do it. And uh, until such time as the, they were then going to be in the process, which was gonna take approximately 12 months to get uh, the land management transferred to the council. So they'd have the authority and it's just drawn on and on and on. Thank you. I, I do I recall, recall. Uh, an application going on. Um, just one more question, if I may, Mr. Mayor. You said, um, I know, Jeff, that you've said, and I've, I know you've said this in the past, that you have the money um, to build the structure. Uh, where's that money coming from? Is that a grant money or is that from the, the RSL club or where's that coming from? We will be applying for a grant. However, if we don't get the grant, the sub branch will meet that cost themselves. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, um, Councillor um, Sheehan, I've just realised I've not asked you to declare your interest on the, on the record. So if you could declare the interest and then I, you can ask the question if you are staying in the matter. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, it, it's, a, um, it's a less than significant um, uh, pecuniary interest. Uh, I, I'm a member of the sub branch. Uh, I haven't served on any committee, subcommittees, or executive positions, either locally or or state. So, so less than significant non pecuniary. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, and did you want to ask a question to Mr. Brand? Yes, I did, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Jeff, could you <coughs> excuse me? Just explain the 
the difference between a cenotaph and the war memorial. Um, there's there's uh, items in the in the business paper that relate to um, names or lack of names and the like. You, you might like to express the difference. Sorry, you muted now. That's it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Sheetha, the the difference between a memorial and a cenotaph is cenotaph does not have any names. Uh, individual names on it. It, it. it is just there as a point of commemoration, whereas a memorial, as the, the uh, memorial in Memorial Park on the corner of Tebbit Street and, jo and George Street, uh, reflects all the names of the people that were in those events. So the cenotaph is a point of remembrance that does not have individual names upon it thanks the the, the proposal that um that the sub branch put to put to council for the um for the cenotaph has got three columns on it um is, is it proposed to have army navy and air force and and that's all on that sorry you just mean it again That is correct, uh, Les. They do have three columns, Army, Navy, and Air Force. And that okay. is all. There's, there's no okay. other going on. Yep. yep. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions for Mr. Brand? Councillor Richards, you have a question? Sorry, Mr. Mayor, no, mine wasn't a question. I just wanted to correct something on the record before debate began. Okay, what did you want to correct? Um, on page 52, there is a mistake in the business paper where it mentions that it's Windsor and District RSL making a proposal, but throughout the report, it mentions it's the sub-branch. Um, I did speak to the general manager this afternoon who confirmed that is an error, and I just need to bring that to everyone's attention. It is not the RSL, it is the sub-branch, and they are two very separate entities. Thank you. And did you have a motion to move, Councillor Richard? Yeah, thank you. I'd like to move um, a motion to debate. I think staff have a copy of that, if they could please bring that up. The one that I circulated? Yes, please, Mr. Mann. Are we able to show that on the screen? And ask for a second. Seconded, Councillor Sheather. Um, Councillor Richards, would you mind if I spoke on that first? Very happy for you too. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So, Councillors, this is a, a motion that I circulated earlier today after discussion with, um, with Mr. Brand and others from the sub branch over the weekend. Um, as I indicated at an earlier briefing, I find the situation fairly unacceptable and a bit embarrassing. Uh, we've had the local RSL sub branch looking to uh, come come to us, you know, almost five years ago, or maybe more than that now, um, seeking to um, have a memorial in McQuaid Park, um, and it should not take that long. Um, there should not be this much bureaucracy involved. I think we are where we are now, and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, but all we can do is, as we go forward, um, signal our support and make it as an easy as process as possible from here. Uh, for those of us who go to the Anzac Day ceremony of Windsor, um, you would have, we know that over the last decade, um, that ceremony has been growing and growing and growing. When I first got elected to council um, back in 2012, um, I think the first Anzac Day ceremony I went to as a councillor that next year, uh, we did have it up on the corner um, near the pub uh, at the old memorial. And there was, a, you know, at that point, a few hundred people. Um, and it was, um, difficult, you know, you couldn't see from the back, you couldn't, you know, people right at the back couldn't hear properly, it's not set out well. Um, from there, it's now grown to many, many, many thousands of people attending these ceremonies. Um, and we've had the temporary memorial brought into the park each time. Um, that ceremony is, is really, uh, for those of us who've been, it's a really moving ceremony. It's a, it, the location adds to it. You've got people all around the park. Um, thousands of people who actually, because of the shape of the park, are able to hear and participate, even if they're a long way back. Uh, and I think 
the fact that so many thousands of people are attending these ceremonies demonstrates that the community, it has community support. This is something the community values um, and therefore it should be reflected in the, in the plan of management um, that this is an, an activity that is important to our community. So what I'm suggesting here is two, two changes. The first one being fairly significant, which is the plan is amended before it's sent in to make allowance for a memorial for the, of the type and scale that's been proposed by the Windsor RSL sub-branch um, in the location that proposed it. Um, so I'm saying that we should, we should change the plan um, so that the RSL sub-branch uh, in, the, in the plan, it actually says that you can have a memorial of that type in that spot. Um, also before us, there was some, um, we were getting, presented uh, with a list of conditions that should be included for the design of any future proposal um, of a memorial. And I've, I've, these are all in there, but I've taken out um, some conditions. I think that some of them were inappropriate. Um, so the ones I've removed first, that it be compatible with other passive recreation use, uses. I don't think that's appropriate at all that a war memorial needs to be uh, compatible with passive recreation. It is of value in and of itself. Um, it is a standalone item and it's important to our community. Um, similarly, I don't think it needs to provide opportunities for multifunctional event space. Um, I, again, I just don't think that's appropriate. It wouldn't require any other war memorial anywhere in the Hawkesbury to be used for multifunctional events. Um, that it continue to include removable elements. Well, if we're going to change the plan to make allowance for a permanent memorial of the type and scale, that's not required. Um, be contemporary in nature. Um, there's already a design before us that I understand has been reviewed by the hierarchy of the RSL and deemed appropriate. Um, it's been there at the park on a temporary basis every time uh, for the last few years. Um, I don't think we need to be prescriptive as to that, that element of design. And I'm also not sure why you would want a war memorial to be contemporary in nature. Um, similarly, address all viewing directions. That would be good if it did. Um, and if it could, that would be great. But I, don't, I wouldn't want to, again, be prescriptive to try and rule out um, the type of memorial that the RSL are putting forward. Um, Again, there's another condition which was a little bit repetitive, which was con consider incorporating removable elements to retain the open, uncluttered, passive recreation character of this location. Um, again, if we're going to allow a permanent memorial, I don't think we need to include removable elements. Um, that it be designed by a heritage architect with experience in the design of memorials. Um, for those of us who have seen the memorial, um, because I understand that the permanent memorial will just be very similar to the temporary one. Um, First of all, I, I think that there's nothing wrong with that design, and I think the board of the community would agree with that. Um, but even from a process point of view, I think it's more appropriate that um, at the DA stage, it is assessed for its heritage impact, um, and it should be assessed on its impact, not on who designed it. Um, I think that's uh, just a, an issue that I would have with that process that we want to be prescriptive, not on what it looks like, but on who is involved in putting it together. And the final condition that I've suggested we remove is that it be designed in consultation with council staff and endorsed prior to the formal development application stage. Um, whilst I'm sure everybody working on this has the best of intentions, this has already been held up for years um, and, and been a lot of back and forth and a lot of bureaucracy. I don't think it needs to be designed with council staff and then submitted to council staff for assessment. Um, I think that the RSL sub branch should be able to put forward the memorial they deem appropriate so long as it meets all the other conditions that a normal DA would have to. So, Councillors, I'm, I'm putting this forward. I think it's about having respect for the role of the RSL sub-branch and for the veterans that are involved. Um, I think that the, as I said, the, the huge attendance of the community demonstrates the community value and support. Um, and I think we should be getting behind this, not getting, it, getting in the way of it. Um, any further discussion? Councillor Richards. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do just want to echo the words that you just uh, said then, and I appreciate all of the elements that you have taken out and put into this amendment. Um, I think it's no secret that I find the length of time and the process that has it has taken for the RSL sub-brand to submit this DA, their idea, and to go through the hoops um, that they've had to be asked to jump through and then the further hoops that they put into the original recommendation in the plan of management was just extraordinary. You know, we are all members of this community and we should be proud of what our RSL sub-branches do for our veterans and for the very special things that they plan to commemorate occasions with. And as you very rightly said, thousands upon thousands of Hawkesbury residents have attended the Anzac Day ceremony with the temporary 
structure in place for the last few years and it has become something of a tradition now. And I want to thank the members of the sub-branch for coming up with that idea in the first place. And I actually want to apologise to them for the way uh, this has played out over the last few years. It is absolutely categorically unacceptable uh, what has gone on. And I'm sorry that you are in this position, that you have gone through so much stress when at the end of the day, you are volunteers as well, like any other community organisation, trying to give something back to our community for a cause that we so very dearly all absolutely respect. Um, I think that the amendment on the floor tonight is a common sense approach to what has not been a common sense circumstance over the last few years. And I think that your this amendment shows leadership. It shows a way forward where we are taking the RSL sub-branch and their concerns into consideration, where it shows that as an elected body of councillors, we have listened to not just what the sub-branch proposes, but also to what the community wants. And I think that that is our role moving forward. We absolutely have to eliminate as much red tape as possible, not just in this process, uh, but in any process. I mean, the things that the sub-branch were asked to do that you have removed could have had the potential to have cost so much money and added so much time to the process. And we have to just stop having that mentality. We as a council have to have the mindset where we say yes to something, or if there's a problem, we say, okay, there's a few issues we need to iron out, but you have our support as a council. There has to be, we have to stop the mentality of no, this is too hard, or no, it's going in the too hard basket, and it will sit on someone's desk for a few years while we try and decide what to do or pretend they'll forget. That is not the way we should be as a council. We have to be not just only encouraging these community-based ideas, but in other realms as well, encouraging investment, actually having our doors open to the biz, uh, to business, to the community and saying Hawkesbury City Council is an entity that wants you to come into our area with your ideas and we will support you. And I think that we have to learn from the circumstances that have happened here. Uh, we have to allow that to never, ever happen again to any other community-based organisation and we have to support the motion on the floor tonight. I think the word that you touched on there, Mr Mayor, was respect and respect is the key word in this moving forward. Respect for our veterans, respect for our volunteers, and to ensure that the Hawkesbury has a legacy moving forward. Uh, I'll say this as a last little, little statement. I don't think that when Governor Macquarie came here and named Windsor in 1810, he expected that the area would never ever change from the way it looked when he laid his eyes on it. I think that our community needs to evolve. It needs to change and adapt in line with what the community wants and expects. And as I said, saying no to things is not the way forward, but saying yes to those things that enrich and make our community better are what we want to see as Hawkesbury City Councillors. So I absolutely support the motion on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Lance Bucket. Um, I've just got a number of questions, uh, mainly coming out of things that have been said uh, tonight. I'm just, just from your amendment uh, that you put out, uh, Mr. Mayor, are you, are you proposing in that? I'm, I'm just going with what it's like. I've, first of all, let me say that I have the, uh, the utmost respect for the RSL and, of course, I have no issue with them having a memorial in a park. But I'm looking at this around the scope of changing here. And so are you proposing in your motion to have McQuaid Park shift in its uh, you know, so in other words, to have it dedicated as the whole area being a memorial park. I know the corner of it is currently a memorial park. I'm just wondering, that's quite a significant shift. I, I'm just, your wording you have used makes me think that you are putting the primary focus of that park as being a memorial park. So say, for example, like Courage on Memorial Park. So is that your intent? No, I worded it the way I did because the current report and even the plan makes reference to the proposal from the RSL sub-branch. Um, so the proposal is limited to that area of the park, which is um, around the western edge, edge of the ornamental pond. Um, and so I, I think I've put it this way, so it's the simplest and easiest way to communicate our intentions, that the plan should be amended so that that 
as that that proposal as detailed in the plan um, is supported. Okay, so you want that specific detail and no changes to that. Um, the second thing, and I think I heard the answer from Mr Brand of this, but um, the point about excluding specific names is just in that it's a cenotaph and not a war memorial with individual names. Uh, the third point is the veterans from all conflicts, including Indigenous, does that mean that this would be a memorial including uh, reference to the frontier wars and to the various historical um, conflicts involving our First Nations people? So, I, I mean, that would be the intention. I think it's important to remember that this is the, the conditions list of the design of any future proposal. So at, at a DA stage, if there was a DA that came in for a memorial, this is one of, being one of the conditions that we have to consider. That's not council putting your memorial in, so I probably can't answer that, but that would be the intention. Okay. Um, oh, so that is still in there. It's just changed a bit from the one that was sent around, that's all. Um, and the other point was, is there anything in our livability project in that part of Windsor that is going to change anything around what's proposed in this plan of management? I haven't quite tied them together in my head of how that uh, might be going. That's it, Dr. C. Uh, thank you for you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, as the work has progressed around the plan of management, they have engaged with our consultants for the design of the livability program, but the livability program isn't undertaken actually any works within the park. Okay, so it's just on the edge of it, but they're to yeah. be compatible. Yeah. Um, I just had one more, and that was just around the um, around the way that we came to be having a new plan of management if we have an existing one. Was that a directive from the state government like we had for, uh, for example, the Pioneer Village and McMahon's Park and so on? Is that a, a requirement by the state government that we are updating this plan of management or did we not have a proper plan of management before? For that to Director C planning. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mem, my understanding is that the previous plan of management was developed as though the land were council uh, owned and when discovered it was Crown land that required a different process. But I might ask the um, manager of Parks and Recreation to confirm that, please. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, yes, um, as the director has indicated, it, the original plan was based on council owning it. When the um, Heritage Conservation Plan was done, it did identify the land as being council owned. Um, uh, that was subsequently proven not the case when Crown Land were looking at all the lands. Um, so they identified it as being Crown Land and under the new Crown Land Act, we are required to do an individual plan of management as it is of historic significance. Okay, so have we since rectified any other potential parcels of land that we might think we own that we don't? Because this isn't the first time I've heard that this has actually happened. I think we had another instance where we thought we were the owners and weren't. So has all that been rectified now and we know exactly who owns what? Um, yep, Mr. Perry. Yep. Sorry. Um, so I guess... Um, Yes, we did report back to council. When, when, when Crown Land first um, raised the new act, we basically went through a process with Crown Land to identify what was, um, I guess, in land that council were Crown Land managers for. Um, there are obviously Crown Land parcels that we're not Crown Land, Crown land managers for. Um, we did report those to council. We then had to identify categories for each of those parcels, which we did. And we received that back, I think, a year, a year ago now from, from Crown. And we obviously then have to work on plans of management for all those parks by the end of 2024. Um, some of those will be generic plans, some of them will be individual plans. Um, but that is, is something that we, we, we need to make sure we complete by that time. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, I won't speak on it just now. I just, I, I do still have other questions. I do, I'm just going to think on it for a minute, um, if that's okay. Thank you. Councillor Sheeva. Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, uh, just in relation to the more, uh, the um, cenotaph with with the um, in, indigenous um, uh, in the, in the defence force, there's all nationalities, nationalities, and have been through most of our conflicts, including in our indigenous um, uh, population. Um, when when they sign up 
into the de defence forces, um, if, if they're um, lost in action, there's two places their names go. One, one's on a local war memorial and the other one's in Canberra. Um, and the the, um, the process that the sub-branch go through to do that is is pretty stringent. And, and in relation to this cenotaph, it was as well. They got the same responsibilities an organisation pretty well as council has. It's not just something that come out of the blue and somebody decided they wanted to build one. There's a whole process they've got to go through. Um, Mr Brand touched on that a little bit, um, but the process is, is quite quite lengthy and, and the likes even before it come to council. Um, in relation to, to where it is, um, and you touched on it, Mr Mayor, the, the, the memorial up in the corner of the parks, on a corner, uneven ground, the steps vary. Um, th to put flowers around the memorial itself is hard. Most of the people who do that, even though there's a lot of school kids involved now, which is fantastic, um, is, is hard. Uh, this is designed with plinths on it, so you, they don't have to bend down like that. They, they can be standing and place the flowers, and um, and there's there's many of them. In relation to the park for the community, um, and, and Councillor Richards touched on it, uh, the, the park is there for the community, and and, and it, it'll change over time. But the main the main use of the park these days is for sport and with all those people that play uh, through the seasons in one year in one day there is more people that stand at that at, at that cenotaph that 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 one that's put in place and taken away in one morning there's more than all the other park users put together um, when you get about 20,000 people, that's a fair whack of our community, considering we've got more, more, more memorials all around the place. But to come to Windsor for one morning, uh, in, in particular, Anzac Day, to have that many people there, um, if that's not in the public interest, I don't know what is. Um, and what, what's being proposed, um, the, the debate that I expect the, the executive had and with, with their... Um, superiors in relation to, to this cenotaph would not have been easy because it's not something that they want people to, or, or, or councils or individuals to have these things all over the place. There's a lot of thought goes into it. And and um, our defence personnel deserve that. You know, um, there's very little council can do to give support from time to time to organisations like the sub-branch. <clears throat> This is one time that they can. And and we, we, we stand up and beat our chests about how, how good our Defence Force is and the people at service. They've given us what we've got today. And and we really don't appreciate the work and effort that goes into it. They they they, they go to, to um and give eulogies, they, they 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 go to hospital visits, they look after widows and, and, and the like. Um the community don't see that. But on one day, and, and there's a few other days as well, the community shows their appreciation for what they do do. And, and, but there's lots of things that they don't know about. Like last night, there was over 3,000 defence personnel that slept in the streets. And, and the sub-branch work hard for that. And there's very little we can do to show the respect for what they deserve. And this is one of them. And we should be working really hard to make it happen. Not do six years. Yeah, I don't know how many people locally in our sub branch would have passed in six years, but they would have been looking forward to the sort of thing that's there uh, that, that's been proposed. Um, we don't have to the the, the sub branch don't have to close streets. They they um, march from the um, <clears throat> from the bowling club, <clears throat> um, stay within the park. And and um, there's never been issues. The police have never been never had an issue with it or like. It, it, it's a good place, and and um, I think our community expect it, and I think they deserve it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Sheeta. Uh, Councillor Wheeler. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, a couple of questions first, if I could. 
um, I'm a, I think I've got a better idea now of what we're actually sending to the minister. Does that include the RSL's plans for the permanent memorial? Um, I'll refer that to the Director of Infrastructure Services. And that's really Mr. Mayor. Um, select, as I understand it, select um, excerpts from the uh, sub branches proposal are included in the current draft of the uh, plan of management. So that's the drawings that we've got as the uh, in the annex to the business paper. Yes, that's correct. Thanks. Um, is it is it likely that points one A and points one B can coexist? So I guess I'm referring specifically to B1 and 2, which are protect the local heritage values and vistas and protect the open visual quality and low-key character of the lakeside landscape setting. Yeah, can you refer that to the Director of Infrastructure Services? Yeah, um, through you, Mr Mayor, it's a little bit of a difficult question to answer, um, not being a, a heritage consultant or a, a, a development assessment officer. Um, so I'm, I'm not too sure I can categorically say whether they can coexist or not. So, I mean, if there's a question, but it might just follow a question there, whether it's to you or the Director C planning. If we if we wanted to support point one A for the avoidance of doubt about council's intentions, should we be removing points B one and two? I think that there is a risk um, that the DA process would pick up points one and two through other means, through a, a referral to a, a heritage consultant, oh, sorry, the heritage um, advisory. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I might ask my colleague, the Director of City Planning to, uh, to weigh in on this as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, obviously, once the application's received, um, we'd be then determining who needs to be referred to, and in this, in this instance, it would be referred to the Heritage Office for their um, input and consideration thank you thanks so that that's yeah this isn't helping me make up my mind i think i i think it would be um following on from what you've said um mr mayor i i think it's sorry and i've finished us asking questions sorry um i think it's um i think it's likely that i think if we removed one b1 and two i wouldn't be able to support this motion, um, but but I am concerned that that we're going to that we're going to set off on this path again, and tell the RSL that we're behind what they want, and then we're going to hit the brick wall that is the New South Wales Heritage Office, um, and it's all going to come unstuck again. So I guess I've got another question: Is there a mechanism where we can run this path? So I know this. I asked this in the briefing the other night, but we seem to have moved to a different. To, to a different program from then. Is there a mechanism where we can get the advice from the Heritage Office on what's proposed in 1A and then make a decision, then go forward with this rather than try and bludgeon this through or, or take it through to the to the to the Crown Lands Minister and then hit yet another stumbling block? Go that to Director City Planning. Or Director Structure Services, whoever wants it. Yeah. Um, sorry, well, yes, I mean, uh, it, there have been instances, through, I suppose, separate through the DA process where, you know, you could have an in, a discussion with the Heritage Office to uh, seek their input um, and, I suppose, try and understand their expectations in this process and, you know, particularly noting that there would be a DA process down the track. Um, and in that respect, um, hopefully you'd be then be able to address any concerns or information that they might be seeking prior to lodging an application. Is that likely to take very long? I know that's that a bit would, of how long. Is <laughs> that, that, that would be hard to answer, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Because my big concern around this is that we, we, is that we give the RSL false hope and say that we're behind this, it's good to go, we're getting this done, and, and it doesn't, you know, and then it hits yet another stumbling block. Um, and because these hoops aren't all councils, you know, this is a state heritage listed park with, um, 
with a conservation management plan that's that that is not of you know that that we don't get to determine where how we tweak um so i think we have to I think we have to make sure when we go forward with this that it's something that that's likely to be successful um, rather than just get bound up yet again i think i think the question too for the community it would be really nice to see and it might make this easier um, for people to process if we could see what percentage of the park would be taken up with this permanent cenotaph? Um, you know, there's as as Councillor Sheetha raised, there's lots of uses for that park. Um, the vast majority of them are quite legitimate, and it's our role to balance the uses of that park. Um, and and this is this is one of them. Um, it's a it's a particularly important one that um, that I think needs to be that the community needs to be behind so that they respect it. You know, I think we've we've all seen those things on YouTube, you know, when there's kids running amok over a cenotaph or, or yeah, and I think people, we don't want people to be maudlin around these, around these structures, but we do want people to be respectful. And I think if, um, if this is presented to the community in a way that meets their heritage um, and open space requirements, it's more likely to be respected and looked after uh, going forward. Um, I've spent a lot of time standing around cenotaphs um, in my life, both as um, as the, the daughter of a, a sailor and soldier, and as a um, as a soldier myself. And they are incredibly sombre places, and um, and and very often become places of great worth to the community. If we go ahead with this plan, then this should be one of those spaces. So it needs to be um, it needs to be well regarded. Um, we. We also need, I think, to include the First, the First Nations community early in this process. We're already talking about honouring um, um, veterans from from all con from all conflicts. I think we need to make sure that this is a process that we take people on, rather than yet again telling in you know, First Nations people what they're going to have. I think we also are going to have to have some pretty difficult conversations with them. If we're going to be honouring honor the frontier wars in one section of the park, we need to be cognizant of the fact that there is a statue of Governor Macquarie who ordered the death of First Nations people in the early days of the colony in another part of the park. And we're going to have to work out how we do that um, in, in order to be sensitive uh, and not pit one sector of the community against the other. Uh, could I ask Mr Mayor for a bit of a, um, a tidy up of your point B Six, which currently says honour veterans from all conflict, conflicts, including Indigenous, be publicly exhibited extensively. Yeah, it's two I, points that have been put together. Yeah, I don't think that's a sentence you want. No. Um, and can we change the word? Can you either capitalise Indigenous um, and make it Indigenous people or um, refer to First Nations people? I'm just going to check the original um, original condition and see if it's been lost in editing. Um, and can I just, um, and then can I just, um, and I'll leave that with you, um, and then just make a, just make a, a one further comment. Um, I would, two further comments, I would have liked to have a meeting, I think it would have been helpful for us to have perhaps the RSL address us at the briefing last week, so that we could really hear what they wanted out of this process, we might have got an easier, we might have got to an easier place now. Um, and I just want to comment on something that Councillor Sheetha said earlier. Uh, there's lots of things that we can do to show respect for, for veterans and their families. Affordable and social housing, and we should be building that into our LEP. That, that is within our power. Uh, things that are not necessarily within our power are uh, support of women, children and veterans when they come home, uh, and particularly better mental health and suicide prevention. There's plenty that we can do that we aren't doing, and it's not just um, cenotaphs, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah, um, I had noticed as well. So that should be a um, point seven um, after the word indigenous, <clears throat> um, and the B should be capitalised. Um, Councillor Dogramachi. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you know, that I have absolutely no idea what this is, and. Uh, the important question that you know, I would like to ask, if you'd be kind enough, uh, either you were answer or uh, counselors, any one of them could correct me. What I want to know is that, well, as a matter of fact, when I was told, when I would, uh, became a counselor, I couldn't believe that you know it was this kind of uh, uh, red tape and this sort of things. Obviously, RSL people you know, have thought about it. And these people, you know, they gave their blood, they gave their uh, tear, they gave their 
their lives, uh, the ultimate sacrifice, and here we are. Well, you, of course, because I don't know uh, the details of it, and uh, talking and uh, doing this one. Next, you know, they will say, yeah, like it says in here, gardens, vegetation, to soften any harsh, uh, harsh edges. Are we going to discuss uh, whether uh, uh, we put uh, uh, tulips or uh, roses all around and uh, that sort of things? Nobody talks about anything uh, about uh, security cameras. That's something came into my mind. We know what happened in Sydney, what, uh, how that uh, monument was uh, defaced a uh, couple of years ago, I think. And the other thing, uh, what I want, I, like I said, when uh, I was told that uh, being in a council or running this sort of things is not like running a company. Do we really have to go through you know, all these things one by one? And uh, uh, I don't know why all these things, you know, taking, you know, for so many years, I was, well, Somebody mentioned that, you know, four or five years. Is it possible that, you know, we could find out, you know, who was sitting on these uh, files? Why nothing has been done in the last uh, five years? Who's responsible for this sort of things? Let's bring these people and uh, let's uh, ask them a question. Why did they put this file right at the bottom? Why didn't they do anything about it? And for that reason, with the greatest respect, seven of you, you know, were in the council for the last uh, five, six years. Why nothing happened? Uh, and is it... Uh, is it uh, just as like, you know, uh, to put this thing, you know, for five, six years and upset these people in RSL and make them suffer? I don't know really yet. Uh, Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Point of order. Councillor Dogramachi is impugning our motives. No one, no one has put may, has done this to insult these people. Well, I, well, I mean, you know, why five, five six years have been waiting, uh, like, you know, for, so, for so what reason? I'll, I'll, I'll. On the point of order, I'll uphold the point of order, Councillor Dr. Machi. We just got to make sure we're talking about the matter before us, not about any other mm. councillors. Like I said, accept my apologies. I don't know about it. Just you know, where, as much as I could, you know, pick it up, you know, from uh, what other councillors you know said and uh, what I heard. What I'm saying is that you know, just pass it through. Uh, don't wait, uh, you know, for the government for this one coming in and then make these people suffer for another year, two or three or five years. I mean, no one is going to put this at the Senate upside down. I mean, these are all uh, common sense. Just put it there. Uh, don't waste any more time. These people have suffered enough for the last five, six years. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reardon. Sorry, Councillor Reardon, you're on mute. Is that better? Oh, yeah, yep. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to say I'm very supportive of this amendment. I don't think it will spoil the vistas or the views in the park. I think the position it's going to be in with the landscaping, it will be very nice. And I notice in our business paper that 70% of the community were also in support of the idea. Thank you. Uh, Council Lines Bucket. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think a lot of the things I was um, alluding to have sort of been cleared up now. I think the the one thing that still sits uh, in my mind is what exactly, I know that uh, when this first came up and when Mr. Brand came to us in 2017 to follow up on this, and I was following up on it, was that I was being told all the time it was at the Heritage Office. Now, what I would like to understand is what exactly the advice we got from that that could help us inform it going forward. I think this is what I'm trying to get at. It's been somewhere for some time. I know there's the issue around the plan of management, but that actual application, or that's what I was being told, it was somewhere having something done. And I think that that doesn't have to uh, delay or do anything about this particular motion. But I think that we should clarify exactly what we understand about what we, you know, because as Councillor Wheeler said, we don't want to propel it forward only to hit another roadblock somewhere and then have to, uh, you know, retrace and start doing it again. Um, I think that uh, the aim that I would see is to have um, the most fitting uh, monument that we can have in line with with the um, aesthetic of the park and and one that also does gain the respect of the community as we do of course 
all respect and thank um, our veterans for their service. As someone who is probably um, been to every Anzac Day since I was born, which is uh, 61 years ago, um, I think that uh, in most um, most towns it is a central focal point and it is somewhere where we gather to um, give our respect to uh, veterans and it is also somewhere that people uh, like to go into the different towns and, and look at them and uh, the little one on the corner is very nice and I, I'm glad to see that that will still be used for the commemorations of those specific conflicts, um, the Korean War and the uh, the one at the Boer War Memorial. I think that that will be really good to see. But I know that the RSL will be very pleased to see this go forward. I'm, I'm just hopeful that we can perhaps garner a little bit more of existing stuff to help it and to ensure that we don't come up against something in the application um, that uh, would hold it up. I was going to um, perhaps suggest deferring. I didn't want to, but I think that's cleared some of it up. But I do still think that whatever uh, Mr Ross was alluding to when he was speaking, uh, I'd also be interested to know what that uh, advice said in that letter that he referred to as well. Um, so uh, I'm pleased, aside from, sorry, aside from this part of the... Um, Petition for the sign. Sorry. Um, aside from uh, this part of the uh, plan of management, I think there's a lot of really good aspects uh, in the rest of the plan of, ma of management. It, the McQuaid Park is a central part of our township and, um, I mean, we really should be giving it uh, the attention that it deserves and it would be good to have a plan of management and to see some things happening there to capitalise on uh, the history that's there, to see the, the beautiful old church and... Um, you know, I, I look forward to seeing uh, what feedback we get uh, when it goes to the Crown Lands for review. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I've just got um, Mr McElroy here getting some instructions on the motion right now. Hit stop video instead of mute um, while I was discussing that. But um, So um, is, that a, is that a question, Councillor Lyons Bucket, or, or it's an amendment? or What was that, Mr May? So you said you're going to move a motion to defer, but you wanted that one. No, I said I had thought of doing that because I had these concerns around the outstanding heritage advice and also what um, Mr Ross had raised, what was in that letter. But I think that this could proceed um, and that could perhaps be looked at. I just think that I just felt there was a few things that, that maybe we didn't know exactly about, but I think that's enough, uh, you know, to be looked at aside from the actual um, motion here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. If I may, Mr Mayor, if that's okay, um, to address the points raised by um, Councillor Lyons Bucket, um, we would expect that as if not as part of any referral to Crown Lands, um, as part of the public exhibition process, that there would be a referral to the New South Wales Heritage Office undertaken at that point, um, so that when Council um, then saw the results of that community engagement frame, um, process back again, that that would then be informed with the advice of New South Wales Heritage. Thank you. Okay. Um, being no further speakers, one of reply, Councillor Richards. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'll keep it brief. Uh, just to say that uh, I hope this does go through tonight, and I would like to request, if I may, if I'm not out of line, that the staff do pay particular attention to this one when it's off with the minister and hope that we get a timely response. And if it does seem to be sitting, longer than necessary with the minister that we do keep following that up so it can come back to council so that we can place that on public exhibition so i guess my last remarks are when to ensure that we let this one stays quite near the top of the pile of priorities given how long the rsl sub branch and of course our entire community have waited for this process thank you mr mayor thank you um so we'll put the motion um all those in favor of the motion please raise your hand Favour are Councillor Connolly, Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Reedon, Councillor Dogamachi, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Sheather, Councillor Richards, Councillor Jurek, Councillor Zemprongo, Councillor Kotlash, and Councillor Calvert. Um, Councillor Michael is absent for the vote. Declare it carried. Um, our next item is um, subject to public address, it's item 43. Um, I have a, an interest to declare in this item. 
um, I've got significant non-pecuniary interest, so I'll be leaving the meeting. Uh, the nature of the interest is that my father is the New South Wales Parliamentary Secretary for Education. Um, whilst it is a different um, minister and ministry, uh, it is the same department. And whilst I don't believe there's any real conflict, I think there's a significant um, risk of a perception of conflict. So for caution, I'll leave the meeting, um, which means that I'll be put in the waiting room and Councillor Carvel will need to chair the meeting. Mr. Mayor, yes. could I just say before you go, did you just say I didn't vote? No, Councillor Vargo was absent for the Oh, Vargo, sorry. No. I, thought said, I thought you said mate because my thing keeps dropping in and out. Okay, okay. thank you. No worries. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I declare my interest as well? I, yeah, I guess yeah, before I go, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be declaring a significant non-pecuniary interest and I'll also be leaving the meeting. Um, as a federal candidate, TAFE receives federal funding, so I won't be participating in the debate or the vote. So. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Over to me, is it? Yeah, just wait for where we need to be put in the waiting room, please, somebody. Okay. I don't know if I can do it to myself. Sorry, could Councillor Richards and myself be put in the waiting room, please? Someone who's a host. Don't worry there. Oh, I think it's because I'm a host. I can't be put in the waiting room. So I'll just mute, stop my video and leave this room. Okay. So, get me. Okay, then. Item 43, which is uh, subject to public address. We have three speakers, I believe, and the first one is Mr. Phil Chadwick. You there, Mr. Chadwick? Uh, yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Council. My name is Philip Chadwick. I'm the Deputy Secretary for the New South Wales Teachers Federation, uh, Deputy Secretary Post Schools. Uh, that, in other words, means TAFE. Uh, prior to that, I spent six years as Federation's TAFE organiser for Western Sydney, which gave me coverage of Richmond College of TAFE. TAFE New South Wales is an Australian icon that provides vocational education and skills to Australians young and old in the good times and the worst of times. Council, I speak to you tonight to seek your support for this motion and for this Australian icon, TAFE. I speak on behalf of Federation's TAFE members. They face punitive uh, action for speaking out under the TAFE New South Wales Code of Conduct. This motion raises three concerns in regard to Richmond TAFE that need to be addressed. Firstly, teacher shortages are impacting upon the vital work that's done by the conservation and land management forces. Classes have been suspended for semester one due to teacher shortages. This is not just a problem for Richmond TAFE, the problem is statewide. Since 2012, more than 8,000 teaching positions have been cut. Yes, since 2016, a few hundred positions have been reinstated, but this is just a drop in the bucket when it comes to fixing the problem. TAFE New South Wales is finding it incredibly difficult to attract and retain suitably qualified teaching staff. Qualified industry experts not attracted to casual employment for only a few days a week. Teachers leave or retire and are not being replaced. This needs to be addressed so that vital semester two courses in conservation and land management are not delayed or cancelled altogether. Secondly, we need to address the cessation of equine courses at Richmond College. This decision makes no sense at all. The equine industry is booming in the Hawkesbury. Just last week, I heard news that the showground had received a substantial upgrade to the equine facilities. I am highly surprised at comments that equine enrolments at TAFE Richmond are in decline and have dropped by 92%, while at the same time, private colleges are flourishing while only offering online versions of equine courses. Do students in the horse industry really only want to study online? And is online only versions of course actually appropriate for the equine industry? Students, one of the things that we've found as teachers during the, the COVID um, pandemic, when many, many courses were forced online, that students actually prefer to have the option of being able to do things face-to-face. -face. Courses such as equine horse studies, performance horses, that is an online thing. You can't 
actually teach someone how to ride a horse, how to manage uh, a horse, and how to do it safely by looking at a video clip on a computer screen. However, the bigger question that needs to be asked is what obstacles are being put in place to prevent students enrolling at Richmond College. Federation members have advised that despite COVID and the loss of international students, had enrolments been allowed to continue, Richmond TAFE would have had 30 to 40 new students in equine studies in 2022. Despite overcoming two years of COVID, no new students are unable to enrol in Richmond because the courses are simply not being offered. This decision was made late last year with no industry consultation. Teachers and the Federation were only found out after the decision had been made. Consequently, any students that had enrolled were called by one of the TAFE managers and they were notified that the courses would not be running. This course cuts the courses, will uh, cost 12 local jobs, 12 local jobs that provide work for local industry experts, which are highly um, respected within the industry. It will also take away the potential aspirations of youth in the horsebury wishing to get a job in the, the equine industry. It also casts doubt upon, thirdly, casts doubt upon the future of Richmond TAFE in its entirety. As courses have pushed online, it undermines the viability of the college itself. If more and more courses are pushed online, what do you actually need the college for if the students are sitting home watching the, uh, the courses on YouTube? We've been here before. We've seen this occur at Chalora. We've seen this happen at Bega TAFE. And only this time last year, we saw almost exactly the same thing, where Scone TAFE, the subjects were white-handed one by one. You're actually out of time, online. Chadwick. Can you, can you round off now, please? Yep, thanks. Um, moved online. Uh, Council, I seek your support in this motion, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr Chadwick. Has anyone got any questions? Um, Councillor Sheila, is that a question? Yeah, thanks, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, Mr Chadwick, um, what's your background? Um, and and uh, you, you spoke very, very well on the matter. I just wish to know you, where you, you know, what, what your work is, what your background is. Um, in, since 1990, I've been, I was employed by TAFE New South Wales. Is I'm an electric trades teacher. I've got 22 years experience uh, as a trade teacher. My background is I'm a qualified electrician. Uh, for about the last six years, I've been working for the Teachers Federation uh, as an organiser. Uh, I uh, advocate and support um, TAFE teachers uh, for the last six years all through Western Sydney. And um, for the last 12 months, I've been in the position of Deputy Secretary, uh, which I now have responsibility and courage for all of the TAFE teachers, all the TAFE colleges throughout the state of New South Wales. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any further questions? Well, thanks, Mr Chadwick. Um, second speaker is Stephanie Calaborn. Do is she here? I can't see her on the, on the page. Do we know whether she's here or not? Do the staff know where, whether she's here or not? Someone on a phone. Stephanie, are you here? If that's you down the in there with just the phone, you're on mute. We have a third speaker, um, Lindy Morris. Lindy, you're here, I can see you. Would you like to address the council, please? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and councillors for having me on tonight. Um, it's very sad, really, that I'm sitting here talking to you. Um, the decision to close the face-to-face -face training at Richmond is <clears throat> catastrophic for my business or the not-for-profit that I run. Um, three years ago, I started a not-for-profit to help um, mentor and guide young people who wanted to work with horses, um, particularly in the thoroughbred industry. Uh, because I felt like in Australia we didn't do a great job at connecting those dots for young people. And we came up with a 12-month educational program. And 
the beginning of that 12 month program starts at Richmond TAFE and we recruit students from all over Australia and they live at Western Sydney University and they all attend Richmond TAFE for three months to start off their, their 12 month program. And we structure it that way because it allows young people to learn safely on the ground with horses before they go into the workplace. So what was really sad when I saw today that um, Robin Preston was quoted in the Hawkesbury um, paper saying that, you know, there are a lot of other RTOs offering this sort of training. I can guarantee you that there is one other RTO in Australia called Melbourne Polytechnic that offer face-to-face -face tra training on thoroughbreds or on horses. And she's quoted as saying that there's, you know, courses, uh, tapes in, in Penrith and, and Blacktown that offered this. It's just simply not correct. Richmond TAFE is so unique and it's so incredible. And the teachers that work there and the horses that they have are second to none in the world. So what you're sitting on in Richmond is this absolute gold mine of, talent and experience which takes years and years and years to build up and in the blink of an eye it's been shut down like we were told just after Christmas that this semester would be the last semester of our, our students there and I just I just could not believe it I, I was absolutely speechless that this could happen um, TAFE New South Wales should be shouting the accolades of Richmond from the roof, rooftops I can't tell you I've been to the British Racing School and, and, and similar schools in Ireland and, and, the, and the kids that Richmond turn out or the young people that Richmond turn out are on par with any of those top schools internationally. So um, I have to apologise because when I did my uh, submission to you guys, um, obviously I'm for the motion and against the closing down of the equine section of Richmond TAFE, but if any of you can help us not see this closed. Um, we've had 110 students through Richmond over the past three years, and that was with COVID. All of those students moved to Richmond, live at the university. They love. We love Richmond. It's it's where we want our kids to be based. It's you know we can do excursions into Sydney. It's just perfectly based um, in proximity, and it's just a great resources. And the teachers are phenomenal. And um, I'm just very sad that this could happen. Okay, thank you. Are you happy to answer any questions? Ms. Sure, Maris? sure. Uh, Councillor Wheeler, you have a question? Uh, thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, <coughs> Maurice, this has been presented to you as a permanent um, cessation of equine studies. This isn't just because there's like, it's not like the conservation management thing where there aren't the teachers or you haven't got the students for this year and it might come back. It, this is, this is the end. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's, I, that's what we've been um, informed in. Yes. That this, it, 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 officially, I think it's in consultation, but um, I, I think that is a TAFE terminology and excuse my ignorance. I'm not across all the ins and outs of how, TAFE use because it is a complex space but but as I understand it this semester now that our students um, are therefore that is the last um, and it's not through lack of t teachers obviously they've got and and it would appear not through lack of students either well not from our perspective I mean TAFE um, the minister is citing numbers of decline of 92 percent since 2016 but I think when you actually uh, scratch the surface and dig down, the numbers that they're, they're comparing at uh, apples and oranges. Um, back in 2016, TAFE New South Wales were in a formal partnership with Racing New South Wales, and 500 of those students, or half of those students that they're quoting, had to do an online induction, um, like a horse safe induction, um, that were that have been factored in, like. Uh, so it's it's really difficult because there's a lot of misinformation out there. But um, I, I think the most important aspect, if I can say this to you guys, once Richmond Equine TAFE is gone, anyone, any young person that wants to learn on horses for a career in horses, whether it's in breeding or racing or the performance horse industry, they will have to do that on the job. There is no buffer there is no going to a place and learning safely before you go into the workplace. So 
if you think about an 18 year old who all they dream about is working with horses, they will not have an opportunity to learn with a teacher and a horse. You know, it's pretty scary from a safety standpoint. It's frightening. So if I'm a city kid who's desperate to work in the equine industry and I haven't ridden a horse uh, because my parents don't have one and they can't afford for me to ride on the weekend and they can't move to the you know, out, out here, for example, and I've had lots of friends who moved out here as kids because they were horse mad and wanted to work with horses. Mm. Um, so you, that's it for me in lots of ways, unless I can pay to enter the industry. That's it. That's it for anyone in New South Wales. Richmond is the last man standing. That is it. So when I say we ship people in, we our program is a national program. So we fly people in from Tasmania, Western Australia, Northern Territory, because there is not one RTO in those states. So it's not even just the kids in the Hawkesbury area. It's the kids across Australia. And the beauty of Richmond is you've got Western Sydney University there and we utilise that campus so that kids that come from far-flung places that have no opportunity, as you say, Councillor Wheeler, to, to learn, they have that with Richmond because you've got the university butted up next door, which used to be the old Hawkesbury Ag. So gone are the days where there's agricultural colleges. They've all shut down as well. So, you know, yeah, it's it's pretty dire. If, if Richmond goes... Well, my, my not-for-profit, which has put 110 kids through, I've raised over a million dollars to put those kids through Richmond TAFE because we pay for the out-of-state students and all the accommodation, you know, we, we put a lot into these courses. So that's, you know, all of that work is gone and it's not about me and it's not about my organisation, but for me it's about the young people we help and the stories of, of, of people that we have helped from a not a horse background that are now achieving their dreams and are great people because they are doing what they love. And, and, you know, in a society where depression and suicide rates amongst young people are enormous and unemployment rates. And here you've got a resource that allows people to truly do what they feel like they're born to do safely. Um, and that's the tragedy. Thank you. Uh... Ms. Maurice, the councillor Dogramachi, do you have a question? Yes, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, uh, Lindy, uh, when, is, uh, when is going to be the last day? So you will uh, close the door. I haven't got tapes last date. Our students finish um, at the end of April and I believe that's it after they leave. So it, it'd be sometime at the end of April. Okay, yeah. is it possible that you and I uh, could meet or some of your teachers as well? Yes, I'm in Richmond most, most weeks visiting our students in, in training. So um, we could arrange to meet in Richmond, yes. Well, how soon can we make that? Uh, I should be there on Friday, this Friday. To, um, you think? Yeah. You've got my details, I think. You know, would you be kind enough to uh, send me some details and confirm a date and a time? Sure. I'll, I'll come and I'll uh, see every single one of your teachers and if necessary, yeah. the students as well. Could you do that, please? Absolutely. And anyone okay. else, um, any of the, uh, the other councillors and, and on this um, call, if anyone wants to come and see firsthand what we're doing at Richmond or what the TAFE teachers do with the students, it's quite extraordinary. And I think you'd be... Yeah, incredibly sure. impressed with what happens in your backyard. And sometimes it takes seeing it to sort of really resonate into how great the training is. And hmm. Okay, if you'd be kind enough, just get a few teachers, one the front line and uh, some students, if you want, uh, I think I'll, uh, I can do something. I will do my best. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Thank I'll you. wait for your call. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Maurice and um, Stephanie. Caliborn, looks like we found you. Uh, would you like to address the council, please? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm a student. I, I've been a student of TAFE since 2016, doing quite a few um, courses through TAFE. Um, earlier this afternoon, I sent through a PowerPoint that if it's okay with council, I'd like to go through, if that's all right. 
Um, firstly, I'd like to give an acknowledgement of country um, and say that um, I, I fully respect and acknowledge the Darug Nation as traditional custodians of the Hawkesbury um, who offered friendship to Governor Philip um, and despite the doctrine of reception, which is a, a um, legislation that um, um, over, oversees all laws, um, uh, custodians have been has been used for much of what we take for granted today as as a capitalist society, both on the Hawkesbury and Australia wide. So Firstly, I, I'll have to ask the uh, general manager whether that's possible for your PowerPoint to be shared. I, I I've sent it earlier, Mr. Mayor. Okay, and secondly, you only have four minutes left. <clears throat> so if we could share the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, okay. I'm not sure how to. Yeah, I, I've I've sent it up, but I can I can um, talk to it because, like you said, I've I've got like about four minutes left. So I'd like to just talk through the PowerPoint if that's okay with you. Um, earlier, yes, I have okay. sent it through. So, um, yeah. Okay. okay. So, I'd like to talk talk about the community and business aspects because I'm talking to the motion from Councillor Wheeler, and I fully support um, Councillor Wheeler's motion. Um, for example, there there are environmental benefits. Um, for example, to actually have um, land where horses graze. Um, is actually appealing to the community rather than have ongoing built up um, built up dwellings. Industry benefits, for example, you've got stakeholder engagement, um, you've got a growing community. So knowledge, for example, specific knowledge that um, local industries want, local industries need. And when I'm talking about businesses and industries, I'm talking about vet, um, vets, for example, I'm talking about um, cash flow into the community, I'm talking about the racing industry, I'm talking about the liquor, the you know, the liquor and gaming industry and so forth. Um, small business opportunities and as I've said earlier, um, employment opportunities. I'd also like to talk about the Hawkesbury weed control um, aspect that Councillor Wheeler put forward. Um, talking about integrated weed management. So it's more than just it, it's more than just looking at um, managing weeds from one aspect. You're looking about um, educating and training people from the grounds up in grassroots knowledge, um, educating early intervening in in um, uh, pesticide um, you know because pesticide like green algae for example is a pest intervene early respect for the community so for example if you're training people in knowledge and skills they they will respect the community readiness for western sydney university western sydney university um, who would be taking um, graduates from tafe people who are graduates from tafe are skills ready not just jumping in at the at the higher end, actually jumping in at that grassroots with level with the knowledge and capacity to be able to um, draft their assignments to standards and so forth. So less opportunity for failure with with vocational education knowledge, geographical distance to the next college. In cases people are travelling three hours from one college to another so that they can maintain skills that that in courses that TAFE is no longer running. So, for example, as a comparison, Hawkesbury local government area comparison with New South Wales and Australia by educational statistics. The ABS census data in 2016 indicates that Hawkesbury, when compared with New South Wales and Australia, ranks as follows. Certificate 2, 19% of the population. In New South Wales, Certificate 2 is 12.9% of the population. Australia, Certificate 2 is 12.8% of the population. A certificate four in the Hawkesbury, 4.8% of the population. In the certificate four level in New South Wales, it's 2.8% of the population. In the certificate four level in Australia, it's 2.9% of the population. The advanced diploma and diploma, all of these which TAFE runs, 9.4% in the Hawkesbury, um, eight point, I think it's 8.8% .8 in New South Wales and 8.9% in Australia. So the Hawkesbury outranks vocational education by both New South Wales and Australia. Finally, I'd like to talk about um, fit for purpose. I have a diagram which you will find um, on your emails of a trailer that actually has community um, children's services running out of the back of a trailer, which actually states ensuring this came from 
Uh, this came from Emirate Professor Peter Colbrake, who wrote the review of, or who oversaw the review of the higher education provider category in 2020. Fit for, for purpose ensures that categories are fit for purpose for all stakeholders, including students, the regulator, and the educational sector, both now and into the future. So You're I don't really understand how. You... Stephanie, um, yeah, I've like, just got one more like thing. To round up, yes, please. Um, yeah. The right to, yeah, the right to education, the right to education, which is a human rights legislation that Australia must follow. The right to education, despite social class resourcing of institutions, including salaries for teachers, restrictions on the ability to study and standards which must be met by institutions. So it really concerns me as a student when I see that there are such gross oversights of issues when it actually comes to digital technology. There are massive, massive concerns. And I, I add that the New South Wales government currently is not following the standards, the Australian Skills Quality Educational Standards, Association Standards, and the um, NCVR, which is the Centre for, for, for Vocational Education and Research. We have major issues with, with digital technology and um, I will leave it at that, Mr. Ben. So would you agree to answer questions if there are yes, any? I, yes, I would, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Uh, Councillor Lyons Bucket, do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I did. Um, thank you for that, Stephanie. And where are oh, there you are. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you for your passion speaking about it. I can see how meaningful it has been for you with your TAFE studies. Um, what do you think will happen to the people in that bracket of people, if they can't, the sort of people that you're saying go to TAFE, what will happen to them if they can't access that sort of avenue to gain their skills? Are there alternatives for them? Um, the, 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 uh, in, in what I'm studying, um, <laughs> Councillor, I, I um, do not feel that there are alternatives close by. And I strongly argue that um, with regard to following the human rights legislation, that there are that there are severe concerns around um, legislation not being followed, social inclusion measures not being followed, um, issues around digital technology, which is students, I, I, I can promise you, councillor, students are giving up. Um, and, and so what is happening is, is it's, to me, I hate to say it, but I feel I should say it, is that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy by the government at this stage. Um, that that to have less students because students give up because the gaps the gaps are widening between social classes because of the lack of capacity to be skilled. Oh, thank you, thank you for that answer. And just one other thing, and I, I I've got my answer to this, but I'd like to hear what you say about it. Um, what's the impact on the industries that rely on ready skilled people if we're not churning any of them out? Um, well. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a, as I, um, as I te teetered on before, um, there is a, there is a huge gap um, in the skills workforce. And there is, despite the fact that the New South Wales government is, is, I must say, is funding courses, um, there is, there is an issue around the capacity to be enrolled because there's a, an, a huge enrolment debacle. Um, and it means that in the Hawkesbury area, um, there are um, there are major concerns about um, skills needs. I, I can see I can see on social media, councillor, quite often that people are looking for looking for workers, you know, and and they can't get them. And you know, look, I I, I must say that I am that I am really concerned about. I'm really passionate about it, um, and I believe um, and I believe not just from hearing me out because I've actually met and I need to need to point the pin where it needs to be pointed. I have met with the business coordinator at Richmond TAFE. I have asked her how come she is not getting out and consulting with the community, why they are not socially including the community. And, and the, um, the business coordinator informed me it's the teacher's responsibility. And I said, no, it is not just the teacher's responsibility. You're the business coordinator. How come you can sit there and collect your weekly, fortnightly or monthly paycheck and think it's okay to leave people behind? I, I must admit, councillor, that I am that I am at TAFE now, so I can learn. But I'm also at TAFE to make a difference because I want to give back what 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 I've received. 
you know, and it's only I, I think that's what a just society is, and I and I won't leave without doing everything that I can do to make a difference while I'm there. Thank you, Council Eliza Bucket. You finished your questions. Oh, I'm finished. Thank you, uh, um, Councillor Calvert, and thank you, Stephanie, for that answer. Thank you, Councillor Wheeler. You have a question. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'm hoping. Um, thank you, um, Miss Calabonis. That was um, a really, really useful presentation um, and really filled in a lot of gaps. I think um, I've got one more gap. Can you explain to me what a connected learning point and what a connected learning centre are and how they fit into the way TAFE functions? Um, if it's okay with you, Council, I'd like to give you my personal experience with digital technology and, and the shift towards connected learning centre. Um, if I'm allowed to, um, if you'll allow me to give three or four examples. Yeah, um, just don't take too long, that's all. Yeah, okay, well, a first example, uh, a, a first example for me is um, issues around students not having um, um, their, their student ID cards. Um, there were issues around um, no ID cards for students, so that we had to do an assessment so there were there, because there were issues around that, the teacher was reading out students' ID cards over the over digital technology. Um, there are issues around the capacity to be able to upload assessments. Um, just yesterday, I was trying to upload an assessment, and every time, I, sorry, I apologise. I, I had to up, all the students had to show um, the teacher what track they were on regarding their assessment, um, so that she could check to see if we were on the right track. Every time I tried to share my document on MS Teams, I got booted. So on three occasions, I was booted off, off um, MS Teams yesterday, and it's not the first time. I, it has happened to me many, many times. One day, I, it took, um, with two library assisting me, two librarians assisting me at TAFE, it took an hour and a half for me to be able to log in to my, to my student portal so that I can access my email, so that I can log into MS Teams. Um, and, then, and then, for example, another, another example um, that happened yesterday was there was an issue online with TAFE Digital. Um, so we, our assessment, we were told to, because we could not click the correct box, the correct answer in the box, the teacher informed us because we couldn't click the correct box to actually be able to send our assessment through, we were told to click the incorrect answer so that that was, accept so that that was accepted. Now, every single one of those um, pieces of information that I've given you is actually a legislative breach according to the ASQA standards and the um, Vocational Education and Training Regulation Act. So every one of those complaints that I've told you is what I'm going to forward and, and I'm informing you that the Hawkesbury with regard to the digital technology as aspect in regard to Richmond TAFE and TAFE New South Wales is failing. And I'm saying to you, I understand what a what a ASQA complaint is because I've already had a campus audited and I'm about to have another one. You cannot continue in this vein of digital technology and put people out into the workforce that are not getting trained because another violation of the standards is to not actually, when you actually say to, when you actually say that you're going to provide a learning package, you say how many hours the student is going to get. So if the teachers are spending 30%, sometimes more percent of their time with digital issues, we are not getting the full component of our training package, which is another violation of the standards. Perhaps and I can, am strong. Perhaps you can round yeah, off so, this, Stephanie. Yeah, okay, that's 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 what I have to say. Yeah. Councillor Wheeler, do you have another question? Uh, no, that's um, that's okay. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all three speakers. Um, some great information given to us there. That's the end of our speakers. So now um, we move to the notice of motion. Councillor Wheeler, um, are you moving? What's in the business paper, or something? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor. I've um, I circulated um, er, late, um, earlier this evening um, a revised motion, and hopefully that will come up on the screen. I'll second that, Mr. Mayor. Just like magic, Mr. There it is. And Council Lyons Bucket is seconding that. Council Wheeler, you wish to speak to that? Ah, uh, yes. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, the um, so look, I think we've I think we've heard um, the the excellent input from the from the speakers, and I really want to thank them for giving their time this evening and discussing this with them. It's a it's a really sensitive issue for the for people. It involves their employment, um, and, in, and it involves their education, which then it impacts 
on their employment. Um, and one of the things that I think becomes very clear when you talk to people about TAFE is that TAFE impacts people at different people uh, people use TAFE at different points in their lives, um, and and it's very often the the at the change in career point or the very beginning of a career point that people most rely on TAFE, um, and it becomes um, incredibly important. Um, I've just noticed a, a minor error. Um, uh, we've got Mr. Mr. David Shoebridge. Um, I can assure you that he is just one mister um you might get the work of two done but he's mm -hmm. indeed just one person yeah. um so so i th tafe is also one of the jewels in the crown of the hawkesbury and we we have we have several of our planning documents that rely on on tafe both for and and talk up the impact of tafe both on you know the, the skilling up of the equine industry and its worth to the hawkesbury um the the provision of services, um, employment, and education, um, and and also the, as a draw card to the to the Hawkesbury, and the benefit of having that that area devoted to trades education because that's really the power of TAFE um, that that hands on skilling up of a of the population and the making of a workforce that we've seen gradually devalued. Um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think it was probably about 2013 when you and I um, stood um, outside Richmond TAFE protesting that round of cuts. Um, and I think um, Mr. Chadwick was there, certainly um, John Kay was there and he's been dead for more than five years. So this is the, this is the continual death of a thousand cuts that we've, that TAFE has seen over, you know, over the past decade that I, that, you know, with, that, that I think we have to stand up and, and try to prevent, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about what's going wrong um, for TAFE. And I think we really need to make urgent representation both to the member for Hawkesbury and her comments today show that she doesn't understand the magnitude of this problem. She's she said that there aren't that that people aren't enrolling because they effectively are people aren't enrolling because they don't want to do the course. That's that's not true. Clearly that's not true. We've just heard that they've been prevented from enrolling. They've been told that it, that they've got nothing to enrol in. So it's not quite the same as not wanting to do it. Um, we've heard that the figures that have been quoted um, by the minister are incorrect and based on what was effectively an industry white card run by Racing New South Wales. Again, you know, if you're going to present statistics to argue for something, then you, there's, your statistics need to be correct. You can't be, you know, you can't be using whatever you like. Um, we've, we've heard, um, and you'll see that that's one of the changes to the notice of motion around the certificate three for conservation and land management that that's happened because and and this is a course that the Hawkesbury River County Council that we are a constituent council of relies on we heard this at our um, at our um, HRCC meeting a couple of weeks ago from the general manager without the course to back up the training of of these trainees that that HRCC relies on to do our weed management work we can't put those trainees on because their because their employment depends on them being actively trained by TAFE. Now, from from what I understand from speaking to the from speaking to the HRCC general manager, there is no other course that does this this training this well. So you can drive for three hours to go to Tokal up near Maitland, um, but they don't teach the same management practices that HRCC uses. So, so the trainees are not only travelling a long way, and these are kids, you know, these are 16 and 17-year-old kids um, in the main. They're not well paid. They, they go into an industry that isn't well paid. At the, ver the, the very least, they can be provided with good training. Um, I think we need to have a lengthy discussion about the appropriateness um, in our LGA of a shift to, um, to this... Um, Oh, I've lost the I've lost the name of it again. Connected Learning Centre, which is basically little hubs of three or four students, up to five students, in satellite locations with a teacher overseeing. Now, for anybody who's had an online learning experience with their children um, or even their their adult TAFE or university level children through COVID, you know how how lacking that process is when you can't get kids into the classroom for practical for practical stuff. Um, I'll pause now, Mr. Mayor, and save the rest for right of reply, I think. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Lines Bucket, do you wish to speak? Yes, please. I'll speak in support of the motion and thank Councillor Wheeler for bringing it forward and for the speakers for speaking about it. 
Um, what an incredibly unfortunate situation this is for us at a local level. I think when I remember when the Richmond TAFE opened amongst great fanfare and what a wonderful addition to our community and to our local economy uh, it was deemed to be. So I think this is very sad uh, for all of us that have seen it there operating for uh, as long as it has. Um, I might be wrong, and I think uh, Suzanne Stewart probably remembers this if I'm right or not, but when we did some work around Hawkesbury Horizons, around the uh, equine industry, I think the statistic was that the Hawkesbury has the most horses per head of population uh, anywhere in, in New South Wales or Australia, but we have a very high and very vibrant uh, both ownership of horses, but also industries around that, ranging from all sorts of uh, equine-related, uh, uh, you know, activities, either horse racing or polo or all sorts of other horse breeding, horse spilling. Um, and, of course, the people are learning skills to work in that area. And as Councillor Wheeler said, not everyone has the opportunity uh, to break into those industries if you're relying on hands-on uh, getting a place at a farm, unless you know someone, that's not going to happen easily. But I think that uh, more, not more importantly, but one of the important aspects is that we do rely as one of our major industries on our educational precinct. And that's our university and our TAFE and our various schools that we have here. It's a part of many of our strategies and plans. It's something identified as a strength of ours in the Western District Plan. And I think we refer to it quite frequently in our community strategic plan as well. So I'm wondering, we can't afford to lose these levels of skills, not just here, but anywhere. Uh, it will take a long time to recover. I think they've seen these issues around TAFE before uh, in various trades and so on. When, when they cut uh, courses and cut numbers, then a few years down the track, you've got this backlog and people are trying to scramble to uh, catch up with people skilled uh, to fill the working positions. And it, it's not just the equine courses here. It's very concerning to see a specialised area around conservation and land management also under threat of, uh, you know, having people wanting to train in that to have to drive three hours to attend um, a TAFE, uh, it, that just is not acceptable that that's happening. Uh, I did have a question. I don't know if anyone can answer it here, uh, but uh, we know there's millions of dollars being poured into educational precincts connected to the Eritropolis and connected <clears throat> to the Western Parkland City. And I'm just wondering if at, if, it's an unreasonable assumption to think that in some way uh, this is a sacrifice for more education being put in elsewhere, a little bit like the loss of farmland for a lot more housing. Perhaps we're losing these agriculturally related courses in line with that. I don't know if anyone can answer me of whether there's any connection or any um, plan to incorporate what's being lost here into any of the new educational precincts that are, are rising up around Bradfield. So who are you aiming the question at, the general manager? Uh, well, the general manager, uh, the mayor isn't here, or I would have asked him about the uh, mayoral forum if anything like that had been discussed, but maybe the general manager or director of planning may have come up with it in one of the, uh, the, the Western Sydney uh, discussions. Director um, Planning, General Manager? Yeah, it's, it's um, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, look, certainly nothing that I'm aware of, and, and indeed there's been a heavy focus um, through the Aerotropolis on the whole um, issue of uh, you know, matter of agribusiness, and that, that's been something that they were keen to promote. Um, I'll refer to the Director of City Planning to see if, if she may be aware of anything contrary. Uh, no, I'm not aware of anything um, specifically. I, through City Deals, education is one of the... Um, outcome areas that they're looking at, but I'm not across the, the information or the planning that's underway at the moment or how that might be impacting the books and, you know, the new Aerotropolis. Okay. Well, perhaps it could be raised that we could be offering these wonderful things if we can retain them here. That would be a, a wonderful thing for our community to see. So thank you for the speakers. Um, it's, it's an interesting area to hear about um, and it's a really disturbing and very sad uh thing to see happening in our community. And I agree with Miss um, Stephanie um, that, uh, you know, the right to education is a very important right. But unfortunately in Australia, we don't 
codify our, our international rights necessarily into domestic law very well. So thank you for raising that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Dogramachi. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, as you know, uh, and as I always say that, you know, give it to my ignorance in these kind of matters. Uh, I do things in a different way. Now, uh, and here it says, contact the member for Hawkesbury, Ms. Robbins uh, Preston and the member, Susan Templeman. The way that I look at it is again, different. We'll uh, contact them, we'll write them a letter and they will pass it to their relative uh, department. And that's it. Uh, bureaucrats, uh, you know, will get into it and they will reply to them. Is it possible that if we could uh, invite both of them and then they will ask them a question and we'll ask them, what are they prepared to do? Where are they going to take our, you know, this problem you know, to their uh, relative uh, ministers or friends or whoever they are? So they could give uh, their words directly to us and uh, we'll take it from there. I don't know whether we could do that uh, or not. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. It is possible, Councillor Dogramachi. One way would be to ask Councillor Wheeler if she wants to add that point to her motion. Yes, uh, please, uh, Councillor, because these, uh, well, when I say you know, these uh, politicians, you know, they know to turn things you know, uh, upside down and uh, pass the buck. How about we invite uh, both of them to Councilor come in person? Wheeler, would you be happy to do that? Happy to add that as an additional point, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Up to you. you. You want to add that? Sorry. I'm happy oh, to, yes. Yep. Yeah. There you go, Councillor Dogramachi. It's an thank you very much. In the motion. Thank you very you, much. Do you have thank anything you. else to add? No, that? that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Semprondo. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, look, I, I do agree with Councillor Dogramachi that there are competing narratives out here, and that's at the core of the remarks that I want to make, because it, it would appear that there is some misapprehension or perhaps misrepresentation about this. Um, I, I support the TAFE system, and I agree with the general proposition that it suffered from a, a very slow and corrosive underinvestment for many years. As an educator, I can say that. Um, on that basis, I'm happy to support Councillor Wheeler's point 2B, which relates to a different course, which suffers from staff under-resourcing. But it's not clear to me that what's happening with the equine courses at Richmond TAFE are as they have been represented to us. I get the feeling that this is fevered commentary and that there are some contradictory propositions and that we're being invited to have council declare a position without enough clarity about which of those narratives is correct. In fact, I've heard some commentary in social media that Richmond TAFE will be closed off or, or flogged off, and that's not only incorrect, but it's, it's, it's frankly inflammatory and irresponsible. Now, I was listening to Lindy, and she says that the minister quoted a decline that since 2017, there's been a 92% reduction in the four equine courses under discussion. And I was also listening to Stephanie when she quoted the relative strength and importance of the equine industry in this district. But I don't think that this is a debate about the health or importance of the equine sector in our district. Of course, it's important. And it's a very healthy sector. But I, it strikes me as a false syllogism. You see, the real issue is the disconnect between the health of the equine industry and what seems to be a very genuine and sharp drop-off in demand for just four specific courses at this TAFE. It bears remembering that the New South Wales government has spent $1.5 million on Richmond TAFE and has developed courses in farriery and agriculture to be delivered in 2022. And that money will be invested in a new veterinary clinic and in agricultural livestock facilities and equipment and the aforementioned connected learning point. Now, that doesn't sound like abandonment of the TAFE to me. And I note that Philip mentioned the fate of 12 staff whose positions were in doubt, but I am told that TAFE are in the process of redeploying those teachers to other duties. Now, there was some footage that appeared on social media today as a kind of proof that there's demand for these courses. But what I saw in that footage was proof that the TAFE is following through on its pledge that all the current students will be able to complete their courses at Richmond TAFE uh, and that the, rich, the equine industry remains important to the local economy. I think what's happening here is that the tertiary educational landscape is evolving. There's a sharp decline in enrolment. 
and it's not a reflection of the equine industry. It's a function of students voting with their feet, uh, which students are free to do in a market. Lindy Maurice says that there aren't other registered tra uh, training organisations, RTOs in this space. But I am told that there are four other RTOs offering the same training within this catchment, not necessarily other TAFE campuses, as Lindy suggested, but third parties. Lindy mentioned a formal partnership with Racing New South Wales, but I believe it's the case that they are one of those RTOs and that they have their own intake. There appear to be really divergent narratives out there and we're not sufficiently informed to form the judgment that we're being invited to. Um, as much as we all support the TAFE system, I think that the government is entitled to ask a common sense question, and that is, you know, what the viability of particular courses are when the enrolment has dropped off so sharply and where that finite resourcing should be allocated. Those questions are asked all the time and they have very little to do with Hawkesbury Council. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Stamprono. Um, I'll consider that as a uh, speaking against the motion. Are there any other speakers? If not, I just wanted to add that during my, before I retired, I worked very closely with TAFE in Western Sydney. And the thing that always concerned me was that funding for TAFE used to go up and down like a yo-yo from one year to the next depending on the political persuasion of the, the government at the time. And that to me is just not the way that you should be running an educational uh, institution. I always think that the funding for TAFE should be set at some kind of minimum percentage of the budget and you should never go below that. Happy to go above it, but to use it um, as a way of balancing your budget from year to year, I always found disgraceful and it upsets communities like ours, it puts people out of work. So I'm very happy to support this motion, but I, I think it's it's actually a bigger problem than what's in this motion. It's it's the way TAFE gets treated from year to year right across the state. So no further speakers. Uh, Councillor Wheeler, would you like right of reply? Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And look, I completely agree with you. Political ideology shouldn't be determining the fortunes of an education provider that's as important as TAFE. Uh, and it's and the the fact that we have seen over the last decade the gradual decline of this once you know, envy of the world in level organisation uh, due to political chicanery uh, as is some, um, yeah, and the, and the build-up of private providers that profit from public education funding uh, and have profit as their key motive rather than student welfare and educational standards, um, frankly, should be a national disgrace. Um, but this is the space that we work in, um, and that's why this notice of motion confines itself to these things. Um, look, I'm a bit not quite sure that Councillor Zamponio was listening to the speakers earlier. Um, we've heard from people who work at TAFE or who study at TAFE that enrolments that people have been prevented from enrolling, that people who were enrolled were told that they couldn't be enrolled not because there wasn't sufficient demand, but because they decided not to run the course. We've also, we've, we're also well aware that the minister is quoting a percentage statistic to back his claims that there's been, an, that there's been a drop off in interest. Percentages are dodgy statistics when they're used incorrectly. And in this instance, I would suggest that they are being used incorrectly. Percentages are really convenient for showing what you want to show, which may or may not actually be fact. Um, they change with the denominator and they change with the inclusion criteria. So the minister's percentage, the minister's 92% drop off does not compare apples with apples. Uh, and it's a, it's a disingenuous statistic. And frankly, if that's all he's got, he wants to give it up as a bad job. Uh, he should be above using the statistics in such a manipulative manner. Um, we've, we've also heard, you know, we've, we've, I think we've heard some really compelling arguments from the speakers that, I, I, and I want to um, repeat Mr Chadwick's comment that the loss of TAFE takes away people's aspirations. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's, that's a tragedy, frankly. You know, we have people, people are saved by, people's educational journeys are saved by TAFE. 
I have a number of close friends whose lives were completely turned around because they could access the sort of practical hands-on adult learning that TAFE provides that you don't get at school and you certainly don't get at university. In fact, if you can't, TAFE has got many people to university and a higher education, a better, more secure job and a different life. If we go, if we, we, we talked earlier about, about care for veterans, there are plenty of veterans who use TAFE as a way of integrating back into society and getting a job that keeps them both housed and sane going forward. Um, We've heard a lot about, about how this is, about how you can, we've heard that you can go and do this somewhere else, these courses somewhere else, but it's not the same as the hands-on education that TAFE provides. It's an industry specific, in many instances, it's industry specific. It's run by Racing New South Wales, which frankly are the big winners out of all of this. They certainly were at Scone, where a multi-million dollar campus, um, incredibly valuable land, effectively handed to Racing New South Wales, when TAFE was devalued. And we've also heard about the attrition of staff. Now, this has been an ongoing um, tactic to, in the devaluing of TAFE, where you ba TAFE, TAFE staff have, ba TAFE teaching staff have, base have been shifted across to casual employment contracts over the course of the last decade, which means that many of them are not employed for the three months that they're on Christmas holidays. That's a long time to live on air. No wonder they go somewhere else. No wonder they're losing staff. People don't want to go into TAFE to teach because it's no longer secure employment. So why would they? they why, would you, why would you set yourself up for that as your job when you can go somewhere else um, and, be, and be better respected? Um, now, these aren't necessarily decisions of TAFE. These are decisions of government, the people that we're writing to and asking for a fairer deal for the students the, and the industry and for the, the LGA that we represent. Um, we, if this shifts to just being about, um, about teaching racing, then a whole other, whole other segments of the equine industry fall, fall away. Dressage, everyone loves to go to the show and watch all, all the horse stuff. There's no, there's no place for that if, if Racing New South Wales runs these courses. All of, the, all of these other, um, all the horse management, people that the racing industry breaks, frankly, because it's a really arduous industry um, that... Where, that people don't survive in physically um, and in some, in some cases mentally are able to either sidestep with the skills that they've learnt for TAFE or retrain using TAFE. This is a vital piece of Hawks, Hawkesbury infrastructure and we, we should be fed with it. up now, please, Councillor Wheeler. I've just finished, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'd like to put the motion, if I can have the screen cleared, please. Thank you. All those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand. In favour, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Dogramachi, Councillor Kotlash, Councillor Sheeta, Councillor Reardon, Councillor Durick, and Councillor Calvert. All those against, please. Councillor Seng Progno, nobody else. Absent is Councillor, is the Mayor, sorry, Councillor Weigel and Councillor Richards. Have I missed anyone? Declare the motion carried. Thank you. If we could invite the Mayor and Councillor Richards back, please. Okay, thank you everybody. So I assume we're up to um, items on block. Um, if somebody wanted to move that. Move Councillor Kotlash. Seconded, Council Alliance Bucket. Um, all those in favour? Against? Clare carried. Um, next item then is item 34, the draft voluntary planning agreement. Now there's no one's called that up, but it's a planning decision, so it requires a, a decision. Um, so if someone wanted to move the recommendation, move to Council. I'll move the recommendation. Seconded, Councillor Sheeta. Was there any discussion? If not, put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. In favour are Councillor Connolly, Councillor Jurek, Councillor Zamprogno, Councillor Sheeta, Councillor Calvert, 
Councillor Lines Bucket, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Collash, Councillor Reardon uh, against. I didn't record a vote from Councillor Dogamachi or Richards, sorry. I have no idea what we're talking about. Okay, in favour, Councillor Richards against Councillor Dogamachi. Declare it carried. Councillor Michael absent for the vote. Um, next item is item 35, the National General Assembly of Local Government. Uh, for everyone moves like there. Moves Councillor Lines back at the recommendation. Seconder, second to Councillor Wheeler. Council Lines Bucket. Um, no need to really speak, Mr. Mayor. Just um, I think that if there are any motions, it says we to get them in by the 28th um, so that we can consider them at uh, the next meeting. So, yep. I think that once we've voted on it, I, I guess that's when you call for people interested in, in going. Um, I'm not, but I'm just saying that. But um, I did just wonder if I didn't see uh, anything in what I read here about the regional forum. Um, I think I've been to them before, uh, but I was just wondering if anyone had any more details on um, that. Don't worry if you don't. I think I know what it is, but I didn't see anything written about it except it's an option. Thank you. Go that to the general manager. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I don't have that detail on, on hand, and I'd, I'm sort of, I'd be happy to circulate that to councils after the meeting. Okay, take that notice. Um, Councillor Wheeler. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to defer this de the decision about who goes um, to the next council meeting when we decide whether we're sending motions or not. Uh, there seems to be a couple of, it looks like they're running a hybrid style conference. And so far they've, every one of the, of the hybrid options I've been to has been a bloody disaster. So it'll be interesting to see if they can manage that. Um, but I'm, I guess I don't really want to go to Canberra. Um, although it was nice last year, it did provide a nice little um not lockdown bubble for those of us who went where you could just wander about and not wear a mask and then all of a sudden we came home and it was all on. Um, but I'm wondering if if we decide to send motions, I think it's we're going to have to have someone to speak to them. Um, so we do need to send somebody and then I think we need to have a discussion about whether we send someone um, physically into the room to debate um, or whether we whether we can just manage with someone online uh, you only get one vote per member body so it's not like you need to have five people to have five votes like we do with local government new south wales but i think we probably need to consider whether we're we're going in for the you know for the to, to argue for for a motion um or or not um before we decide whether people want to give up you know three or four days um for a trip to canberra so to do that i think we could just um, the motion could just be point one of the recommendation, I believe, um, and then staff could bring back points two and three when the motion's on the table. Um, Councillor Lines Bucket, did, are you happy with that? That's fine. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. May. Yeah. So the, the motion before us then is just point one of the recommendation. Okay. So. I guess the only consideration, Mr. Mayor, is if there's early bird pricing that we're missing out on if we put it off for a couple of weeks, because it's it's really expensive. I guess, yeah, but the flip, I, I think it's a really good idea, Council. Well, the flip side is if we don't ever send anybody, you save a lot of money. So, um, yep. Councillor Kolash. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, um, I agree with Councillor Wheeler that it would be good to be able to have a bit more time to put the, these motions in. I have quite a few that I'd like, but I don't know whether I've got enough puff to get them done by tw the 28th, but um, it, that seems like a, a really tight time frame. Um, I think it's also really expensive, but a, a virtual attendance of $689 seems outrageous. So I think we should send people to Canberra on that note. Um, um, I'm, yeah, happy to, happy, to, um, happy to just have the first um, point that was going to be my point. So, um, yeah, that's that's my take on it. Thank you. Okay. Um, in that case, there's no further discussion. Uh, with the motion. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand. 
Faber, Councillor Cotlash, Councillor Connolly, Councillor Jurek, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Sheather, Councillor Zemprogram, Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Reed, and Councillor Richards. Against uh, Councillor Dogger March, who can't use against. Uh, Councillor Bike will have second vote, declare it carried. Um, next item then is item 36. Our submission to the motion reform. Somebody want to move something? I will move the motion in the business paper, Mr. Mayor. Recommendation, Councillor Wheeler, second of Councillor Cotlash. There's no discussion. Um, put the motion. Oh, sorry, Councillor Wheeler. You're on mute, Councillor Wheeler. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I'm struggling with the transition to the laptop. Um, clearly, I'm badly out of practice or getting old or something. Um, I think I think the 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 um, the submission from the staff I think raises a lot of um, a lot of really useful points. I think we. I think we need to be really cautious about these changes to the legislation. I think, and it, there's been um, some some things that have been raised that some some of which are you know, span um, the the state, but some of which are uh, highly relevant to to the Hawkesbury LGA, particularly the problems around um, around infill development and um, and contributions um, for for infill development. We've you know, we've just passed another VPA for some infield development. We know that that 30,000 per block isn't going to cover the legislation that we need to put up. Um, sorry, the legislation, what am I talking about? The infrastructure that we're going to need to put in, you know, it never does. Um, the, the caps that that um, on VPAs and on and on developer contributions leave ga great gaping holes across our, L our across our LGA. Um, maybe not when the development first hits, but certainly when people move into it and they expect all the things they were promised in the brochure that aren't there. Or in the case of some of our our, our areas uh, like Glossodia and Freeman's Reach years down the track where things haven't been done properly and we then have to stump up the money to fix them. Um, there's, I've got real, real concerns about the impact of inflation on capacity to actually fund work when we get to that work. Um, you know, the, the money that you obtain from the developer is free, you know, particularly in areas of, in times of very low interest rates, is, is frequently not matched by, um, um, by the by, the interest that you might get um, while you sit on that money, waiting to deliver the infrastructure, the infrastructure seems to always cost uh, a significant amount more than was than than was projected. Um, and then what we see repeatedly is existing ratepayers subsidising new developments, uh, whether it be through an SRV or through going without um, somewhere else, um, or through having to run down what we what we have. Um, so, and then, and the developer profits and move up, moves on, and we've we've seen that repeatedly here. Um, when when you force councils, and there's a there's a um, the 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 push to get councils to to put in an SRV to raise to raise money that that isn't covered by infrastructure contributions, is not only it doesn't only shift the cost burden onto the rate the rates base of the LGA it shifts the political burden as well from state governments that pass this legislation onto local councils who then have to expend their political capital asking for a rates rise and taking you know making that decision um, to the to the people and I think many of us are well aware of the impacts of that um, as a council um, we we really need very strict mechanisms um, around the regional infrastructure contributions. The, the idea that you can get one LGA to pay and that money can be used across the Sydney basin um, for infrastructure is extraordinary. And I think if, rate, if, if our community was aware of that, they would be shocked that you could bleed money out of the Hawkesbury LGA and have that money end up in Vaucluse or Mossman is extraordinary. Uh, but the, but, and it, it, may, it may be improbable, but the legislation currently allows for that. We need a much more transparent and equitable process of, of, dis, of the distribution of the RIC funding. Um, and we need to really use um, sale value for land value, because that's the price that councils have to pay when they buy that land for infrastructure. And we've seen that affect this council before. Um, 
rate payers need to should be entitled to just cost considerations in the same way that everybody else in this equation is. After all, they're the ones who pay at the end of the day. Um, I don't know why there, and the, the submission covers this. I don't know why you would you would seek to cap contributions required to provide public infrastructure. A twenty percent cap means that existing residents either cover the gap or they do without. The community shouldn't go without while the while there's windfall profits for developers. That that that's not a reasonable um, expectation if, of any um, of any um, anybody when dealing with a piece of legislation. And I th the other thing that, that it is highlighted in the report to us is the need for council to establish an affordable housing contribution scheme as soon as possible, because currently we don't have one. And it may, we've, ha we've now had, um, in, the, in the last decade, we've had, we've had, um, we've had one or two big housing um, developments. We're due for another two more. And at no stage have we been able to extract an affordable housing contribution for any of those developers. And that leaves us with a big hole, but in the future, it leaves our community with a big hole and we need to correct that. Um, at the moment, I think it's gonna be too little too late. Thanks. Thank you. I have one speaker in favour, anyone wishing to speak against? Nobody against. Further speakers in favour then, if required. Councillor Brogno. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll start with a question to staff and then make some remarks, um, probably to the Director of City Planning. The two reforms identified in the consultant's report to us and the briefing that we received recently indicated 7.11 and 7.12. Now, 7.12 has more impact uh, in situations like the situation that we're proposing in our new LEP, where we open up the area to more granny flat or secondary dwelling development. 7.12, if I'm not mistaken, is the mechanism by which we would uh, gain some funds for local infrastructure. My question is, did the report that we received analyse the impact of these reforms to section 7.12 in the light of what we are seeking to do in our new LEP, like that. So that's the Director of City Planning. Um, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, the analysis was done just based on current trends uh, and, and I suppose the, you know, what's happened to date, as opposed to what we might anticipate happening in the future uh, under the new LEP. Thank you. Right, okay then. So my remarks are these. Uh, I support us making the submission. I've read through it. Uh, I, think it I think it broadly hits the right points. I think we are right to be sceptical about this. I think the state government has a poor track record and for them to, after decades of cost shifting, simply move to a model that says, look, we're just going to take all of this money and we're going we're gonna to give, we're going to leave you with even less autonomy about where that money is spent. Sounds like a bad deal. I'm unconvinced that the analysis that we were given effectively says that for our circumstances, it's cost neutral. And I concur with Councillor Wheeler that there are a range of other unintended or foreseeable consequences that could be quite negative for us. I think our ratepayers are rightly very sceptical about any idea that means that when they look at a development like Vineyard, Vineyard Stage 1, Stage 2, um, and that developer contributions are being collected by somebody is that if they fall short, it is for those residents in Karajong or Belpin or Oakville or elsewhere, they're going to end up paying for the infrastructure because the developer contribution scheme wasn't adequate to start with. And I've gone on for years about the fact that um, our neighbouring LGAs were able to um, levy developer contributions up to the cap and then had a generous top up through schemes like LIGS, the Local Infrastructure Growth Scheme, that meant that they were able to ultimately spend between seventy dollars and $90,000 per block to get the appropriate infrastructure in. We were never vouchsafed that kind of money. And now, even what we've been collecting uh, to try and do infrastructure with, it sounds as though it's going to be taken away. And I think that deal stinks. So let's make this submission and be heard and summarily ignored like we tend to be. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Program. I'm not sure that's exactly what the submission says, just for clarity. I think the submission um, raises a number of issues that Councillor Wheeler raised. 
um, but broadly doesn't raise a problem with the reform in general because the reform in general is likely to be a positive outcome for Waterbury City Council's financial position going forward. Um, Councillor Lyons Bucket. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a question that I was actually going to ask in the last item, but I um, wasn't quick enough, um, but it relates sort of to this as well. So we know in uh, the previous item with the BPAs, uh, basically a BPA is our only option there because uh, we don't have the uh, contributions plans for those specific areas and so on. I'm just wondering in terms with this sort of reform, what impact that would have on our capacity to be making more meaningful developer contribution plans for the specific areas around, um, you know, in the different parts of the Hawkesbury, or is it going to deplete us from doing that, if you know what I mean? Like, is it sort of trying to substitute for what we may be moving towards getting developer contribution plans for uh, any areas that might be targeted for any future growth? So that's the director city plan. Um, yes, it doesn't um, deplete our ability. Well, I mean, ultimately, though, what this is prompting us to do, and, and to be honest, is on our to-do list, is to review and update our uh, 712 plan. Um, and this will allow us to obviously uh, adjust the rate, the current rate, um, and to collect more money uh, as we apply in different areas. Thank you. There was just one other thing I wanted to draw attention to uh, in the discussion section on page 35, and that was um, around, I just thought that maybe an explanation was required for people in terms of the changes to the rate pegging, but it says that um, the potential uh, impacts and key considerations include the premise of the government's contribution reform package that the population growth adjustments to the rate peg will provide councils with sufficient revenue to meet the needs of the growing communities. Could, given we have been given a rate peg of 0.7%, would that be something that is a fair statement uh, applied to our council area? As in uh, the rate peg is definitely right. not sufficient. Um, yep. Yes, you could say the rate peg is not sufficient and that is certainly an argument that um, many councils across the state are making. Okay, thank you. I think the rest of what's been said, particularly echo what Councillor Wheeler said about the shortfalls that our ratepayers end up paying, we are seeing that there. And I mean, ideally, I think factored into when they come up with these uh, various plans is that we have to look at the longevity of uh, infrastructure delivery because, uh, for example, around Pitt Town and so on, there's some of the original infrastructure that was put in for that development is now having to either be repaired or upgraded or redone. And then that is the developer contributions are gone, but um, the work still needs to be done. So then uh, if it's not grant funded or it's not still coming out of contributions, then the ratepayers are having to pay for that. And I think that that's where we will find an increasing burden if we have money uh, taken out into a regional uh, fund as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, we can put the motion. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Favour of the motion are Councillor Connolly, Councillor Jurek, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Sheather, Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Cotlash, Councillor Reed, and Councillor Richards, Councillor Zamprogno. Against Councillor Dogramachi and Councillor Bicol absent the vote, declare it carried. Um, next item is 38. Would you wish to move something here? Can I declare my interest, please, Mr. Moore? Sorry. Mayor? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. My interest is less than significant non-pecuniary. I'll be staying in the vote. Uh, as the federal candidate, there is has been federal funding in the past for this, but after confirmation with the general manager, point three, uh, in terms of the agencies they are writing to, it is only state government agencies. So I'll be staying in the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody wish to move something here? Anybody want to move the recommendation or something else? Move the recommendation, Councillor Wheeler. Uh, could I could I add a point? Could I get some advice on adding a point four, Mr. Mayor? Do you have a specific point four? Uh, I'd, I'd like, I think it's valuable to have um, 
a public update, and I know we've got an email update and the residents are being told, but it would be really helpful to have a, um, an update about what's happening with the roads, particularly the roads or the, the infrastructure recovery stuff um, that that's, comes to us regularly in a council meeting, in part because it, under the current code where you can't ask questions without notice, there's no capacity for us to ask staff on the public record without a 10-day time lag um, about um, these infrastructure projects. And I think it might be um, helpful for the community who are, um, who really uh, have, have, you know, they've waited more than 12 months now um, or at least 12 months for, for some of this work and they're starting to get a bit fractious. Um, if we could build the, a regular report in a council meeting um, into the count into a, if we could build into council meetings a regular report on on the roads um, or the infrastructure upgrades. Um, I don't see why you can't move that. So I guess point four would say um, council receive a report um, a, a report to eat to um, to account to the council meeting or. I don't know, words that actually make sense, because clearly I'm not at the moment, um, every two months. So, yeah, council receive an update on infrastructure recovery in the form of a report to council um, at least every two months. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So that's a bit of manager for comment on that, and, and yeah, that's it. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's perfect, Lassan. We have no, no problems preparing a report of that nature. Um, we'll just start to taper them off as the words progress, I presume. Okay. Uh, seconder for that? I'll second it, Mr. Mayor. Seconded to Council Lines Bucket. Um, discussion? No? Okay, put the motion then. Um, Sorry, Mr. Mayor, just, just briefly. Um, just to, I just I just want to um, I just want to comment on that extraordinary um, figure um, of of damage of thirty one point two million um, and and two years to fix it and um, and just get some comment if possible um, on the mechanism what mechanism we've got in place to ensure that we can forward fund and complete this work in the in the time frame that we've been given i mean it's it's that's an extraordinary amount of work for a council of our size so just to clarify the question is about the cash flow or about the project management well about both i mean we've, we've, apparently we've got two years to fit to, to in to to equip this um this funding when we get it um, or to complete the work, uh, how can how do we do this? Yeah, I might. Just, I'll throw that question to um, the general manager in a moment. I might just point, just just echo that sentiment though, and just let council know that I've certainly raised that both with um, both with meetings with state politicians as well as our federal member. That um, a clear gap in this whole thing is that we get funded and we're the first responders, um, but there is no assistance with project management. There is no assistance for the fact that we're delivering work equal to a couple of years of um, capital projects in one go, um, whilst we're also um, in many cases suffering damage to our own council assets um, and trying to recover from that as well as staff disturbances. So I think uh, it, it is a big gap, um, certainly raised it, no joy at the moment. Um, but I think we do have to keep advocating in that space, but I'll refer that question specifically to the general manager. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And certainly um, it's, a, it's going to be um, a challenge for us. I might actually pass to the Chief Financial Officer, particularly around um, that 30 odd million dollars um, and the arrangements that, that we have in place and that we've been seeking preliminary approval um, from Transport for New South Wales on those particular projects, um, which will certainly be more across the, the details of, um, of those payments, Emma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, so at the moment, we have got a number of claims that have been lodged with various agencies. So those claims include claims for um, emergency and immediate restoration works that have already been undertaken. Um, and there's also claims that have been made based on, on estimates, um, some of which are um, quoted in, in this report. So in terms of forward funding, um, I mean, at this stage, the cash flow has been sufficient to, um, to be able to do those emergency works. Um, the concern is that when we commence on the major projects, such as Greens Road um, and Upper Colo Bridge, um, obviously at that 
point, we do need some, um, some certainty around the timing of, of funding. Uh, my understanding is that there was um, some discussions around getting some funding upfront based on some approved designs. So that's what we're gonna continue to pursue to make sure that the cash keeps coming in to fund those big projects. So there's no immediate issue now with cash flow, but certainly yeah, if we start doing those big projects, um, there is gonna be an impact. Um, and the fallback position would be to get to go and get loans um, if we start having issues with the cash flow. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Lyons Baker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had a um, question about the table, about the ta uh, table one, the road location damage. Um, oh, hang on. Was it table two? No, table one. Um, just around uh, the number of land slips that are occurring, um, I'm just wondering, first of all, I would think, I don't recall over the past nine years or so having this level of damage, and I assume it's to do with the increasing uh, heavy inundation and extreme weather that goes on. But I'm just wondering what sort of monitoring or stabilising is done around uh, to address the risk of land slip, um, and, and are they you know, are they likely to be due to an instability or are they just random how this occurs? I don't know how you would know if one's happening, but I'm just thinking if this is going to be a cost that uh, we're, we're facing or, or we have to be recouping for, is it something that's monitored? Is there something in a road or an area that you can tell? Go that to the Director of Infrastructure Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, it's, the, the, the area is known um, in geotechnical circles for its susceptibility to landslips owing to the, um, the geology of the area. So it's an inherent risk in, in where most of our roads lie. Um, no doubt the uh, presence of the drought prior to the, the flooding in 2020, uh, which commenced in 2020, had a large part to do with not, um, uh, no, not experiencing any landslips uh, on our network. With respect to um, detecting them, we don't have, I'm, I'm not aware of any program to monitor um, landslips. These are often occur in naturally occurring um, slopes, uh, not necessarily cuttings. Um, and any uh, inspection program would be in addition to and, and beyond what we currently do in terms of inspecting our uh, road network. Thank you. I, I just wondered in terms of, um, so are we ever undertaking any works that we're sort of not certain that we're going to get uh, money back in times of emergency? Are we fairly guaranteed that mostly we will recoup everything that we do? Um, Refer that to the Chief Financial Officer. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. So the claims at the moment, they're a mix of works that we've already undertaken. Um, as emergency works. So that expenditure has already been incurred and claims have been put in. Um, so at this stage, we don't really have certainty that, that we will receive that money, but um, hopefully we will. In terms of um, undertaking other major works that we didn't need to undertake straight away, um, the process has been that we've put in the claim based on an estimate and essentially we will wait until we get some certainty around approval before we can actually um, finalize the scope and undertake the, the, the works. The reason why we need to wait is that um, the funding will dictate um, the standard at which those works are completed. So if we went and sort of undertook the work before knowing what we're gonna get, we could be at risk of um, not getting fully funded for that work. So okay. that, that is why there is some major works that, you know, um, probably urgently need the funding so we can start on. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you for that. And just one ancillary question, because I just saw it came up in the report when I read the report. Um, do we have any updates on the uh, PFAS investigations that were being undertaken by the RAF a couple of years ago um, around Brickabees Creek in particular, and uh, any information on any further spread of that contamination or any further incidents uh, in either one of the, any of the lagoons, Baker's Lagoon or um, around the Rickabies Creek area because that seemed to be a thing and then it just vanished. So I don't know if we ever got a concluding report on it or what sort of happened with uh, the PFAS contamination. I'm not sure it's totally relevant to the item we're talking about, which is the funding. Well, it, it is mentioned in the general manager. 
It's, it's referred to in there. That's why I'm asking it. I don't know that it would impact our decision, no, that's what I'm saying. But I'll probably refer to the general manager. Yeah, and, and um, I'll, I'll be honest, councils in my sort of eight months here at council, it's not something that, that's been spoken of, other than we knew that we had to, um, to do a little bit of work down there at Cornwall as part of um, those restoration works. Um, perhaps the Director of Infrastructure Services? Um, sorry. Um, well, I, I don't know the latest, and you're right, it has gone a little bit quiet. I don't know if it's due to COVID, um, but we can follow up on the uh, actions that the rough base are doing in relation to PFAS and, and some information through. Take that on notice. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, being no further, no further discussion, we'll call that and no one speaking against the motion, we'll put the motion. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Favour of Councillor Connolly, Councillor Jurek, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Sheather, Councillor Bucket, Councillor Rudin, Councillor Zamprogna, Councillor Cotlash, Councillor Richards, against Councillor Dobramachi, um, Councillor Bicol is absent for the vote, declare it carried. Next item is 41. Quarterly um, budget review statement. Somebody want to move to receive that? Moved Councillor Zamprogna, recommendation, seconded. Councillor Lyons Bucket, any discussion? No, with the motion, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Favour of the motion of Councillor Connolly, Councillor Jurek, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Sheather, Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Reardon, Councillor Zamprogna, Councillor Cotlash, Councillor Richards, against Councillor Dogramachi, uh, Councillor Weigel, that's vote, declare it carried. Um, next item, there will be uh, notice of motion one. Councillor Wheeler. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll move the motion um, as it appears in the business paper. Seconded to Council Lines Bucket. Discussion. Um, so look, this is this is um, basically exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, back in December 2017, Council passed a motion to look at um, about um, to to um, to develop a report uh, the, about increasing our tree canopy um, and really because we were then pushed, um, st strategic planning was pushed to shift straight into the LEP and DCP review um, due to the requirements of the state government. And because we didn't have a sustainability officer at the time, this went onto the back burner. Um, I don't think that the sustainability, uh, that the um, strategic planning staff um, have any more time on their hands. And I suspect that the staff member who um, had begun doing this work has now left, um, the, has left council, uh, but I think the the current committee structure allows us as a committee to to start uh, the work on this um, and perhaps um, take some of that pressure off the staff and finally get this up and running. Uh, we've had some funding for tree planting and that's great, but if we had an LGA wide policy about um, tree canopy improvement, uh, it would facilitate us getting more funding uh, and also make that funding easier to roll out once we got it. We I think we rely too heavily on um, on the areas of the LGA that have good tree cover uh, to, to up our tree cover statistics um, and because it's pretty evident when you drive around uh, lots of the LGA, the, the urban parts of the LGA, that the tree cover is sparse at best. Um, by having a policy, we upskill our residents and give them information about appropriate species. Um, that means that they are less likely to have a weed um, impact, um, but they're also less likely to be trees that are constantly hacked by integral energy when they come through um, on, their, on their annual um, tree um, tree destruction path, uh, which gets people really upset um, and um, and puts many trees, puts, puts a lot of trees at risk. It also makes a lot of trees unsafe um, due to inappropriate pruning um, techniques. If we can plant the right tree in the right spot at the beginning, that gets around all of those problems. Um, so I think this is, this basically this is just digging up um, an, an old motion and, and trying to get some action on it because I think it will be valuable uh, for the LGA going forward. It will also feed into the, um, the livability city deals work um, through Windsor, Richmond and South Windsor and hopefully complement that with a rollout of street tree plantings through our other um, urban areas and, um, and potentially car parks and other council-owned spaces. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Sheeva. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
Mr. Mayor, I was impressed with the information that in relation to this um, this notice. Um, the only concern that I have um, is that um, that there needs to be programs done in some areas where trees are going to be planted. Now, I spoke to the staff about it. I'm talking about along pathways, roadways, um, where there's other infrastructure, power lines, gas, water, all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, around parks and stuff, you, you know, there's, there's different variety of trees, as Councillor Wheeler indicated, that but when it comes to um, public, public thoroughfares where you've got cars, you've got people um, walking and the like, um, where you can have root um, infiltration into, um, you know, road works, curb and gutter, all that sort of stuff. So I, I don't have any, I, I think that what's been proposed is pretty good. I just think the council needs a policy on what variation of trees are planted in areas where they're going to be issues. Um, or otherwise, we, 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 you know, the, the, the plain trees going into Richmond is a good example. Beautiful. Um, try walking along behind them and, and have a look at some of the road um, works and that, that there. So it's horses for courses. Um, but in saying that, um, I spoke to the staff about it and, and they said that wouldn't be hard to, to, to program such a, such a direction. And um, so I'm not, I'm speaking in favour of the motion, by the way. It's, it's just a concern I have in that regard. Thank you. Thanks. I'll just speak briefly in support of the motion as well. Um, Council's recently started planting uh, just over 300 trees as part of the Greening Our Cities grant program we received from the New South Wales government. And uh, the feedback we're getting on that project already is overwhelmingly positive. Um, everybody's on board, everybody wants more of this happening. Um, so I think that this, this motion is, is good. At, like, like Councillor Bill said, it, it brings up something that sort of seems to have gotten lost. Um, we'll refer it to the committee and the committee can develop and recommend back to council what policy we should be adopting to make this happen. So I think that's uh, happy to support it. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I also support this, but I just wanted to add a few things. Um, where you've got these new housing estates like Marsden Park, um, the streets are so narrow that <clears throat> if you try and plant a tree there, the a lot of the um, residents pull them out because there's no parking, no parking available for them. And they don't want a tree taking over their parking spot. They don't mind if the people down the other end of the street have got trees, but they don't want them in front of their place. And so when Blacktown Council planted a lot of trees in there, um, a lot of them disappeared. And so planting trees to me is not just about planting the tree, it's about planning the whole development, the whole estate, so that trees are integrated into the planning from the start and there's room for them. And that's the only way that you can achieve some of the, uh, the aims of cooling our suburbs. And uh, I'm sure Councillor Wheeler knows that, but I just like to somehow, if we can note that or get the committee to note that in future planning, we build in space for trees in any future housing developments. And the other thing is, I think there is a, a list of preferred trees. Um, I, from memory, it came from Parramatta, but I'm not sure. Um, and But those preferred trees may not be totally applicable to Hawkesbury, but I think it'd be a starting point for, for this discussion. I, I'll see if I can look that up and add it to the... Uh, add it to the mix. But yes, I, I support this um, this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Four speakers in favour. Anyone against? Before we go to further speakers in favour. Councillor Zembrogno. Thank you. And, and, and briefly, my remarks are, um, A, I think this is a good example of how our revamp committee structures ought to work. We find something worthy like this and we delegate it to one of those new super committees and I look forward to seeing whether that model works in this case. Secondly, um, I would be delighted if this um, work leads to some intelligence about what we're doing with trees in areas that are currently being clear felled for the development around Vineyard Stage 1 and, and I suspect similar things will probably end up happening up at Jacaranda at Glossodia as well. We've got stands of existing trees being felled, it strikes me as a great tragedy. I think in some cases it's remnant Cumberland woodland. I would have thought that it would have been protected, 
manifestly it isn't. And I think you can get a head start instead of planting a new tree, save an existing one that's 100 times the size. So I, I don't know whether it falls within the remit. I'm simply expressing the hope that it does. Thank you. Council Lines Bucket. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll only be brief, and I, I agree, couldn't agree more with what Councillor Sambrano just said about, you know, we try and save the tree instead of knocking it down and then talking about what we're planting instead of, and we're set to possibly lose, you know, more and more trees over time. But just further to what uh, Councillor Calvert just said about the list of uh, suitable trees, I just, there was just recently a study came out at looking at uh, suitable street trees factoring in climate change and uh, going forward. So I think that this gives us an opportunity to update even what we were talking about in 2018 and incorporate these new studies around what is going to survive as we move into those very, very hot times uh, going forward. So I think this is a good opportunity and um, look forward to, to seeing it more getting in action um, and of course, contributing to the state tree canopy uh, quota or whatever it's called, target, the, the state tree uh, canopy target. Thank you. No speakers against. Uh, Councillor Wheeler. I'll just um, write a reply, if I may, um, Mr. Just, Mayor. Just briefly, no, no speakers were against. So this is I just wanted to um, to, to um, comment on a couple of things that that were raised, um, and I've I've made notes um, of um, Councillor Calvert's uh, comments about um, about estate planning, and I think that that's something that can come out of um, of the work of the of the committee. Um, I think I think it's it, it, it's really um, worth worth pursuing. Um, I think once we've got a, po a, a a strong policy on on tree canopy and tree planting. We're in a much better bargaining position with developers when they come to us and they want to put um, some, you know, want to put various plans in place. Um, we can say, well, look, no, you know, we've we've got this agreed position, and you need, and then I think some of that work then needs to be shunted into the DCP as well, so that we've got even stronger positions on what we will tolerate as a council um, to to improve um, things. Um, Councillor Sheath's comments about um, appropriate trees. Again, I think a policy will enable people to choose trees quite quickly that are appropriate. We've had some input from HEN already, um, and um, it would be the Hawkesbury Environment Network, and I think we need to go back and revisit that. Um, and it would be great if you know, we could then get our community nurse to stock the appropriate trees for people to, to, to get um, and plant or for council to plant. Um, and... Um, Regarding the plane trees leading into Richmond, you know, that's one of the bugbears in Windsor Mall, in fact, is the plane trees because half the LGA is allergic to them and I'm one of them. You know, if you've ever tried to sit under them when they've got all their little puffballs raining down on you, it's really miserable. Um, but those trees actually are, are very unlikely to survive the next couple of decades with increasing temperatures. They're already showing severe signs of stress and the University of New South Wales has flagged them as, a, as an area that, that may not survive increasing temperatures with climate change. So we really have to, you know, we, we have to future-proof um, the, the recommendations that we make. Um, and I think too, um, regarding Councillor Zamponio's comments about protecting the trees that we've already got, I think that needs to be a key part of any policy and I've noted that as something the committee can explore but I think we probably need to start looking at better mapping and better capacity to monitor this you know that came out in our discussions last week around the rural boundary clearing code we know we have a deficit if we're going to do if we're fed income about doing this then we need to cover all our bases both protection and planting thanks thank you uh, with the motion all those in favour please raise your hand favour the motion of Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Connolly, Councillor Jurek, Councillor Doramachi, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Sheather, Councillor Andy Bucket, Councillor Reardon, Councillor Zamprogno, Councillor College, Councillor Richards, Councillor Michael that was absent for the vote, very carried. Uh, next item is 44 at the Maggots. Councillor Collash, with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Second is uh, Councillor Lyons. Thank you. Um, I'll start by saying that I love maggots. Um, I had the opportunity to study them when I was at uni and I, <laughs> Les, it's okay. It's okay to love maggots. Um, they're truly beautiful little creatures. Uh, it's hard to believe that they are. They're really lovely. 
they play a very important role in our natural um, world and they're nature's converters. Um, and it seems now they're being harnessed into helping us deal with our food waste problem in a, in a really sustainable way. I got my motivation for this notice of motion from Albury City Council, who have just started using their first maggot-based food waste system. The system is a modular one and it's, um, it kind of looks like a shipping container, a, a large sh shipping container, and it uses all sorts of um, racks and robotics to organise how they feed the, 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 um, the maggots. And it uses black soldier fly larvae um, and they consume food waste from all sorts of um, sources like industry, uh, restaurants, supermarkets, um, it, any, 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 any source that has some sort of organic food waste, it can be used. And, they, and it's also, uh, they're able to also consume some packaging, which is also very exciting. Um, another huge benefit of these types of systems are that they're truly sustainable as they have byproducts that are highly valuable. They produce protein for animal feed and high quality soil conditioner. Um, and these are as an end product of the process. If you look at our real rural land strategy, you'll see that the Hawkesbury has plenty of chicken, duck and poultry and egg producers. Um, we, we have all those sorts of industries that can directly benefit from the, from the I guess, the waste products, if we, if we want to use that very outdated term, waste, the, I guess, the byproducts of, of this process. So um, I was a bit startled to know that, that uh, a lot of these industries actually import high-protein feed, soya-based high-protein um, uh, feed for, the, for their animals. And they import it, you know, it comes from other places in the world, and yet we can actually produce high-quality protein, you know, on our doorstep. So that's kind of, I think that's really exciting. And there's also a myriad of vegetable and turf growers, orchardists who can use the, the soil conditioner that comes out of this, the, the other byproduct that comes out of these sorts of systems. Um, there's, there's also a system at Bank Barangaroo in an underground car park that services a lot of that, um, that kind of precinct. And so that's its versatility. It can actually be in a, in a space like that, just on a slab, um, and uh, it doesn't have any odour. It doesn't have any, um, uh, well, I think it has some odour, but it doesn't have a huge impact on their surrounds. Um, so it takes up a few parking spaces in the, in the, in the, in the, um, the Barangaroo underground parking. So look, just to summarise, um, th this is obviously um, a new technology and it has to be explored. But just, uh, just to summarise, what I'm asking council to support is um, to include these types of systems in our waste strategy. And this will, this will help us attract any sort of grant funding that might be appropriate to this and available. If we have these types of things in our strategy and recognise them, that gives us a bit more strength in that area. I want to ask the Environment Committee to help the process of consulting and to be able to help us with our decision making and input into our waste strategy. So that's a kind of a parallel process, I guess. And another pa parallel process is that I'd really like to see us look at um, the possibility of a cost effective way of us implementing possibly a, a pilot project or something that gets us into this technology kind of now, not in three, four years or, you know, when we've finished the strategy. I want to be able to, um, I want to be able to get the staff to, 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 to see if we can to investigate what's, what is needed in this area and to be able to put it into our budget process, our budget consideration process for next year. One of the things that I, I learned about these systems is that um, quite often they're, they're leased. So it's, a, it's not a huge capital in, in cost for council and it's managed by, you know, companies that lease them so they come and manage it. So to us it's 
it, it's a sort of a cost saving um, at the ready, I guess. And I'd really I'm love to. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'd really love to see us do this, and I and I hope that you're all, as the mayor might say, pro mag maggot. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. If you if you get Councillor Cotlash talking about maggots, uh, five minutes. Sorry. Is there <laughs> enough, um, exactly. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to add that um, I, I approve. I agree with this, but I think I'd like us to put something in there about working with Wesrock on this issue because I know Wesrock um, uh, has a lot of programs with waste, and I think this could be included and maybe. Um, Maybe we just mention the word Wesrock in point um, the point which talks about the committee point four. Yep. Um, nothing formal, just that we talk to them and see what how we can work with them if we, if we could. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we need? I don't, I don't know that we need to. Just for simplicity, we probably don't need to change the resolution. I think we could, general manager, we could take that as an action. To, uh, I'm happy just to put put that in. It's it's not okay. a problem. Yeah. What do you want to put in then? Oh, well, I'd say um, um, council request that the um, Environment Committee, oh, <laughs> broad community, including Wesrock. There you go. That'll do. <laughs> so Can we do it by the committee? Based on from other government agencies and in industry, Wesrock, the hospitality and grocery industry, and the like, and the broader community. That'll do. Yeah, this is what I was avoiding. But that's good. Um, second, uh, Council Lines Bucket, we okay if we make that change? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, Council Lines Bucket. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. And I too am a lover of maggots and um, <laughs> having studied in a similar vein at one point. Um, but uh, what I'd just like to add, and I think this is great, and I think that these are all the systems that are coming now that are, are emerging and that we can capitalise on. Um, I just think that uh, in point five, in looking at a pilot form, we did have, when we had the FOGO working group in the Waste Committee, we did have a a ready, willing supply of um, restaurant people who were ready to be involved in a pilot. And we had arrived around that as well after looking at the difficulties of implementing in the residential area around collection and all that sort of stuff. So the restaurants were prepared to give their, um, you know, bring their things or have a collection point. So perhaps when we get to that point, um, it will be easier to start off with someone like restaurants who have a ready supply um, because I think that there were some issues around uh, the introducing it in the other sector. But I think that it will be great and I think that's wonderful of Albury City Council, which is quite a big council, so that's really uh, good that they've done that. And um, I look forward to seeing what we can do. But uh, definitely um, also I think that when we have that environment committee, we could either invite or one of us could invite the people who were working uh, on the waste committee on this because there were people who actually work in the industry. So they might have some, not on that specific project, but on other areas around that, particularly about the end use for a lot of these things. So that would be very beneficial to introduce as well. Thank you. Councillor Wheeler. Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, firstly, I, I think it's very early in the term for us to be having um, comments like um, item 44, all about the maggots. I think that might go down. Um, I'm not as fond of maggots, but that's because my research has been done on humans and maggots are not compatible. Um, I think what, what's really nice here is that we're talking about shifting to a closed loop system that, yeah, and I think yeah, Councillor Cotlash raising the idea that you would be importing soy feed for, for stock when you can, when, when we've got this going to waste, like this is currently rotting in our landfill. It's a major component, you know, up to 50% of the landfill that we dump every week is, is something that could be producing multiple end products. Um, getting around our, our landfill problems, you know, we are, we know we've got about seven years left on the on if we if we just adopt a business as usual um, system, but we've also got a legislative requirement now to shift to FOGO, um, and so we and, and people are crying out for it. You know, I've been keeping an eye on on count on council's web 
page where we've got that ongoing waste survey and the comments that are coming back on, on Facebook about that stuff are really, really interesting. You know, I think we've probably need to put our helmets on when we deal with the, the um, you know, this, I think today's question is, is whether you want more hard rubbish collection. Um, and that's probably not as cheerful, but the FOGO post got loads of really positive comments. You know, people want this. They've seen Penrith running it for nearly a decade and they want it here. Um, yeah, and I think we need to. I think we need to jump on board. This may be a system that works for us in a landfill site that's quite that's yeah increasingly close, I suppose, to development, um, but is also constrained by um, by a high water table flooding, yeah, potential flooding um, and runoff concerns. Um, yeah, this is this is actually a pretty clean system, um, and and works pretty well. It, um, it even comes. A, apparently from what I've read of the Albury model with a depackager, which allows you to get the produce out of the plastic that it frequently comes in. Um, so I think this is a, it, it looks like it's a public private partnership for Albury. I know they've done some other really interesting public private partnership stuff on their tip um, around solar power and methane generation. Um, yeah. And the other thing that I'd really like to see us running on, um, on, on our um, waste management site is a, is a much bigger tip shop of the scale of something like Bellingen or Mossvale, where you're really starting to repurpose the stuff that comes over that Waybridge. Um, but this should also reduce, I hope, some of the costs that we pay to the EPA, you know, that $3 million that we pay to the EPA every year, we could start recovering some of those costs by, by producing a usable end, a usable sellable end product. Um, rather than just dumping this stuff. I think it, I think getting the restaurants on board is going to be key, and I suspect maybe the supermarkets as well, because I think apparently the Albury um, set up produces five tonnes of, of food waste a day. That's a lot of waste. Um, but I think we may need to get um, like some sort of... We probably need a bulk, yeah, someone who provides the bulk um, for this, and that may be that may be all of those restaurants together, or it, it may be one big contributor like Woolies or Coles or or, or Aldi, um, you know, who are, who are outsourcing, you know, who are who are trying to repurpose a lot of their stuff. You know, they're not just sending everything to landfill, but I think you know we we might need to to be in partnership with one of those organisations so that we've got the scale that makes this viable. Thanks. Thank you. Um, no speakers against. Do we need a right of reply, Councillor Cutlash? I'd just like to say just a few more things. Um, the my understanding of my understanding of this um, system is because it's modular, it's it's very flexible. Because if you happen to be able to um, tap into the to the domestic, <laughs> I was going to say the domestic waste market, but the domestic collection, if we have separate bins for food waste then you'll be able to tack on another module. So that's the, you know, that's the, that's the beauty of this. So it's, um, it, it's very flexible. I, and I can't wait to find out whether it will suit our purposes. I think because we, we do have a tip and we do have um, a tip that's, you know, running out of space. Um, and, you know, if we can do those sums about whether the, this is going to be cost effective in the long term and whether, you know, how long it, it might extend our, our um, cells and the tip for might, you know, proved to be really exciting. Um, I was going to say something about what Councillor Lyons Bucket said and I've just um, forgotten it, I'm afraid. Um, sorry, that's it. Go yeah. maggots. Yeah, with the motion, um, all those in favour, please raise your hand. In favour of Councillor Connolly, Councillor Jurek, Councillor Dogamachi, Councillor Carver, Councillor Sheather, Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Reardon, Councillor Sam Progno, Councillor Cotlash, Councillor Richards, Councillor Wheeler. Uh, Councillor Weigel was absent with the vote. Declare it carried. Next item is item 45. Councillor Lyons Bucket. I'll move the motion, Mr. Mayor, with a point four, which I've sent through to, to Tracy, which is to, um, I haven't got it in front of me, but it's basically that this uh, go into con consideration for the um, for the operational plan in 2022-23, uh, the cost of the review, of course, uh, to do that because there is a financial cost. Seconder. Call out because I can't see you if you're doing it. Councillor Wheeler. Councillor Wheeler. Sorry, Mr Mayor, I'll second that. <laughs> Speaking for an hour. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll speak to the motion. Um, this is something that I think I know I've phrased it in the past, but I thought now was another really opportune time uh, to bring it forward and to consider uh, certain things around the parking availability in our town centres, partly because of changes in retail habits and hopefully of the capture of people to shop locally and support our small businesses a little more now that they've uh, often made a realisation of what wonderful uh, local businesses that we have. Um, but one of the main things is around the timed parking zones and whether they're adequate for what we need. Now, of course, we need the varied uh, timing because, uh, you know, like near the post office, 15 minutes is good because you shouldn't take longer. Although now even post offices have transformed into these sort of buildings full of big packages because so many people also shop online as shop locally. So uh, just looking around that, I did raise it uh, with Miss Perrin around Christmas time where the one hour parking uh, zone in the back of Coles was, um, you know, people were being fined in there and quite frankly, at Christmas time in Coles, one hour was not enough to get in uh, to do your shopping and we were encouraging people as we were sort of coming out of the lockdown, encouraging people to shop in our small businesses in that area. So uh, looking at the timing of the parking and then something that has long been brought up and it's brought up in, in various sections. There's not a lot of businesses. Some businesses have on-site parking um, uh, in, in the town centres, but a lot of them don't. So in the arcades, et cetera, there's often a business operator that's a solo business operator. And for them to go and move their car from the time parking area, they have to lock up their shop and go out and move their car and come back. And for some people, uh, that is a lost customer, perhaps at that time uh, while they're out doing that. So I think that um, other councils uh, must have you know, things around these sort of systems. It may not be viable. This is why I think we should look at it because, of course, I don't even know how many people that applies to. And, of course, the translation from what we hear in anecdotal evidence to what may actually be the numbers is what we need to know because we do get people very um, outraged around parking. Uh, today there's another on the Hawkesbury Mums and Dads page there's another thing around parking offices uh, marking tires in Windsor somewhere and that generates everybody questioning uh, what council's motive is uh, in the past uh, I think we've raised should we have some sort of paid parking somewhere um, I don't know I think people don't want to pay for parking because they can go to another nearby center and not pay for parking um, but uh, I think it's just time that we had a look uh, around this. And because I knew that uh, there was some work done around parking in the livability project um, and some changes in the parking in the main streets and so on, I, I just think this is a timely to put it in to consider if we're going to, to understand what the cost would be to do a review of this nature. I think it's inevitable. I think at some point we're going to have to look at this because um, I think it directly relates to our retention of people shopping in our town centres. If you go out, and like today I took my mother out, she's nearly 97, and we went to the nail salon and uh, we went to some other places like that, and it's not a fast thing to do. It takes time and you simply can't do it in an hour. You, it can take, you know, three or so hours. And then if you want to go locally, then you've got to find a car park and then walk, you know, a, a longer way to be parked in a residential street, then walk to the shopping centre. So I think that, uh, and I wasn't here, I was in Springwood. Um, but um, I think that it's, I hope this gets support to at least consider looking at it in the operational plan, because I think it's something that um, our business community expects us to do and our shoppers expect us to do, to, to be updated on what the availability is and issues around the timing and for business operators as well. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. I'm just wondering whether the traffic committee should be playing a role in this as well. Um, 
that's just a general question for, for you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I wouldn't have thought so, but I might refer that to the Director of Infrastructure Services. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the um, Traffic Committee is a statutory committee that is charged with the responsibility of considering um, any proposal by Council to exercise its delegations for the regulation of, path, of traffic, oh, sorry, of traffic regulating devices. Um, if there were proposals to arise out of any such work that would uh, modify time parking, then those specific proposals would go to the Traffic Committee. Um, but not a broader um, study uh, of, of a town centre scale. Okay, so we wouldn't have them in the study, but if the study came up with some recommendations, those would go to the traffic committee. Is that the idea? Yes, that's correct. So any anything that would um, modify on-road uh, traffic regulations, such as conversion from um, one period of time parking to a different one, um, loading zones, no stopping zones, no parking zones, etc. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Wheeler. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I want to thank um, Councillor Lyons Bucket for, for bringing this to Council. Um, it's, it, this has been an ongoing issue in the, the time that I've been on Council. It was raised repeatedly during the Town Centre's working group um, and, and it comes up over and over and over um, from both business owners and, and people using our town centres. Um, I had um, many conversations with the previous Director of Infrastructure about some sort of interim measure to address this. I know we're looking at parking in the town centres uh, work with the city deals and livability funding. Um, and I know that we're, that, that's one of the things that, that we hope to, that, that, is, that is being addressed in that in that work, but we can't wait. Um, this is this is impacting businesses. Um, it's also people are people are also getting fined, um, and you know it's it's easy to say someone should just you know people should just move their cars, or you know people should just be more careful. Um, but I think you know anybody who's lived here for, for any length of time has probably had a parking fine because uh, they just haven't realised how short some of the time frames are. We've also got some real inconsistencies with some parking areas where you can have a four hour limit. In one spot a two hour limit in another spot um, and come out as I did attending a council function to a hundred and sixty odd dollar fine because you incorrectly parked in the two hour spot and thought you had a bit more time on your hands I paid that fine um, but it did hurt um, so I think I think we need to move on this um, I don't think we can we can continue to to kick this can down the road um, the the other issue that I that I had discussed with um with mr organ when he was still here is is the um is bringing in some sort of timing mechanism that means that you can't move your car within the within a car park so um one of the business owners in richmond uh who's in um the is in um one of the malls there reports that that the employees of services new south wales come out and swap their cars over at lunchtime, which means that that's never that those those car parks are never really empty in that large car park at the back of um, I think it's Park Mall that runs through to the park, so that would make sense. Um, and and so so when people when shoppers come and they, they don't want to be there for a particularly long time, but they but they want to go to a string of small businesses. So it's not, they're not in and out in, in 10 minutes. You know, they want to go to the butcher and the fruit shop and, you know, and um, you know, possibly round to, to, to the post office. And the, I mean, and these days you get stuck in the post office for a good half an hour, just picking up a single parcel. So I think, you know, we, we need to, and so to not be able to park, but to have a decent load that you want to carry, uh, it's it's onerous to lug it down to Francis Street where there's park, where there's untimed parking, it's too far. So we need that, that, that we need that fast, that reasonable turnover of parking close to the shops. And it shouldn't be taken up with employees and businesses who, and business owners who are, who, who are there for eight, to 10 hours so you know, I can understand business owners if they're there late hairdressers particularly which often have a young staff wanting to be able to park close to the shops uh, to their shop and I think we need to look at some sort of permit system in in those instances but if you've just got employees who could walk up the street once a day and back and back home again they should not be sitting in our shorter stay car parks and these are the things that we have to address in the in the parking systems that we've got uh, and we need to do it now I, I don't think the community is going to be willing to nor should they have to wait for another couple of years while we 
while we put this off um, to, to do it as part of a bigger picture. Um, no one's spoken against it. Did you want to write a reply, Council Lines Bucket? Not necessary, thanks. Uh, with the motion, uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand. In favour of the motion of Councillor Connolly, Councillor Jurek, Councillor Gramachi, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Samprogno, Councillor Reardon, Councillor Lines Bucket, Councillor Sheather, Councillor Collash, Councillor Richards, Councillor Wheeler, uh, Councillor Michael is absent from the vote. Very carried. Uh, item 46, uh, Councillor Dogramachi, move that. Yeah, is there a seconder for that? Seconder for item 46. No, I think it fails for a seconder. Um, item 47, move that Councillor Dogramachi. Yep. Is there a seconder for item 47? No seconder, it fails as well. Um, item 48, response to councillor questions, take it on notice. Any questions there? No, can I have a motion to go into confidential? Thank you. Uh, move councillor Richard, seconded councillor Kotlash. Uh, any discussion? No, put the motion, all those in favour? Against, declare that carried, and we'll wait, wait, wait to bring confidential. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in respect um, of item 049 regarding a property matter, leased to Urban City Consulting, PTY Limited, Johnson Wing 4, Christie Street, Windsor. Whilst in closed session, the council resolved on the motion of Councillor Kotlash, um, seconded Councillor Sheetha. One, uh, the council agreed to enter into a new lease with Urban City Consulting, PTY Limited, in regard to the Johnson Wing and four car spaces for Christie Street, Windsor, as outlined in this report. Two, authority be given for any documentation in association with this matter to be executed under the seal of council. Three, details of council's resolution be conveyed to the lessee together with the advice that council is not and will not be bound by the terms of its resolution until such time as appropriate legal documentation to put such a resolution into effect has been agreed to and executed by all parties. Um, for the motion were councillors Connolly, Calvert, Richards, Reardon, Jurek, Sheetha, Zampronio, Wheeler, Lyons, Bucket. Captured everyone. Against the motion was Councillor Dokomachi and Councillor Vegel was absent for the vote. In um, respect of item 050 um, regarding a proposed road closure adjoining 24 Toll House Way, Windsor. Whilst in closed session, the council resolved on the motion of Councillor Kotlash, seconded Councillor Week, Councillor Schieffer. One, the council approved the sale of the road reserve adjoining 24 Toll House Way, Windsor, which comprises an area of 126 square metres, as shown in attachment one to the report, to Joanne Margaret Shembury in the amount detailed in the report. Two, uh, authority be given for the sale and any documentation in association with the matter to be executed under the seal of council. Um, for the motion were councillors Connolly, Calvert, Richards, Reardon, Jurek, Sheetha, Zampronio, Wheeler, Lyons, um, Lyons Bucket. Against the motion were councillor Dogramachi and councillor Vigal was absent for the vote. Thank you. Can I just ask, was my name read out there? And uh, you were the mover oh, of the motion, but yes. Thank you. Um, being no further business, uh, we'll declare the meeting closed at 10 p.m. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance. Good evening.